Hey, everybody. Welcome back to Building Bridges with Greg and Jill. We're so excited to be back with you again. And uh, uh, today we have a very, very exciting podcast. But we want you to know that what we're all about here is to help people from different perspectives come together and engage in conversation and uh, building relationships so that we can kind of learn from one another through the journey of life and, and through the experiences that we have with one another. So so often is the case that we allow ourselves to kind of uh, camp uh, with folks that think like us and, and act like us and behave like us, and then we have a hard time engaging. And in this culture today, in the society today, where there's so much division, we need more bridge building, we, meet, we need more relationship building. So we uh, offer that to you through our podcast. We're excited, Jill and I are, to uh, have uh, the opportunity to be with you again. And if you like what you're seeing on Building Bridges with Greg and Jill, we would really love to have you like and subscribe and share with uh, others that... Uh, that what we're doing because in particular i think today we have jill and i uh, a tremendously exciting opportunity to have a conversation with some really amazing uh, gentlemen who are involved with the chosen and uh, if you don't know about the chosen yet you're hiding under a rock, I think, because uh, it's a phenomenon, really. It's it's become more than just a TV series on the internet. It is now a movement, I think, of people who are very, very excited about building relationship with Jesus Christ and having a conversation about who he is and, and the stories of Jesus from the New Testament and the Gospels. And and it really is drawing together people of of a wide variety of Christian traditions, but also uh, people that not don't necessarily come from a Christian tradition and are learning about Jesus in a unique and fresh way through the work of Dallas Jenkins and, and the larger chosen team. So anyways, we're glad to have you. And uh, so I'm going to introduce our guests and let them say hello. Uh, Jill, I'll first uh, flip over to you. Um, welcome back. Uh, it's good to be with you, my wife uh, uh, of 23 plus years and to do the podcast with you. Uh, do you want to bring a greeting? Yeah, we're so excited about this podcast today. Um, we've done a couple before this that have been had some great responses. Yeah. So yeah, so used on, to different. <laughs> <laughs> there you go, right away. You so good. So we'll look over here. Uh, well, first, uh, Brad Pello. Uh, we met first uh, recently, very recently, on on a, a phone call. And uh, so, Brad, welcome to the program. Good to be with you. Thank you so much for inviting us. We love what you are doing in building community among faith leaders and and believers here in our state of Utah. Yeah. And Excellent. Brad is the executive, executive producer. Yeah. E executive producer uh -huh. for The Chosen. Yeah. Excellent. Now, are there multiple ex executive producers or one or how does that work? <laughs> it's it's a title that gets used for many different purposes okay. in the entertainment world. Okay. Okay. So I happen to be an executive producer who actually works on productions and running the business of The Chosen. Okay. Um, other executive producers that are listed there, well, Daryl is an executive producer, but he also plays another role. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it's, it's, it's a term that is used broadly in the industry. Excellent. Okay. Well, and then Daryl, uh, nice to have you and to, to meet here. you today. Yeah. Outstanding. Uh, you're all the way up from Hurricane. That's right. We don't say Hurricane, <laughs> we say Hurricane. Right. Uh, I know that. Uh, but uh, bring a greeting as well. Yeah, no, it's, uh, I'm grateful to be here. Um, watched a couple of your podcasts. It's a lot better with her than just you solo, just to let you know. <laughs> <laughs> a lot better. Okay, uh, good. No, but, um, you know, what I loved is, um, you know, I've, I've built a career around content and I love the authenticity and the vulnerability, you know, in a couple of your podcasts as of late. And uh, I'm like, man, I, I would love to be a guest and here, here I am. So Excellent, excellent. Well, and, and your role, uh, Brad was just saying that you are an executive producer yeah, so as well, but you're the CEO of yeah, The Chosen. Yeah, so Dallas and I co-run um, okay. in different aspects the The Chosen, and I'm also the executive producer and also one of the co-founders. Okay, so. excellent. Well, I think it's just time to jump right into this thing, yeah, and we're going to have a great conversation uh, as uh, as folks listen in. I think, I think there's a lot of intrigue to understand the relationship that is emerging, I think, um, in the larger Christian tradition, but uh, particularly among which is relevant to our audience here in Utah, or a lot of our friends in Utah, is the relationship between the chosen and the Latter-day Saint community and the evangelical community, or sometimes referred to as traditional Christians right. and Latter-day Saints. Um, so um, what I would love to do is ask both of you um, kind of uh, uh, where you got involved, how it all began for you, how did you meet Dallas Jenkins, and you know, kind of set up the whole story of how both of you got connected to the chosen story. Yeah. Well, I'll start out since I you know, started it from the beginning. <laughs> yes, right, right. Now, I do think it's important to point out that 
that both Brad and Daryl are LDS. Yes. And so that's oh, sure, why sure. this is unique to have this conversation and for them to be involved in something that, that maybe started out as an evangelical thing, but as God has worked through it, it has become everyone who wants to have a relationship with Christ is, is really yep. experiencing a wonderful thing. And, and like you said, people that don't even know Christ. Yeah, yeah. So how I got involved was um, I'm a serial entrepreneur. I love um, business. I love disrupting things. It's just a very fun thing. Um, I've been working in the industry of content, uh, specifically online, uh, YouTube specifically, of building audiences and getting eyeballs on projects and um, getting content seen and then also monetizing and I built a career on that and I started an agency and that's what we worked with, some of the biggest brands and YouTube channels in the world. And um, I found a need of knowledge. I think knowledge is one of the most important things that we can acquire here on earth. And it helps us have a little bit better clarity on our path. And I noticed that there wasn't really a conference in the space that um, would help the creator look at the monetizing options uh, to create more. And, and so I created a conference called Vid Summit, and uh, we would bring in the top, you know, business leaders and marketers and YouTubers in the world, and we would just kind of learn from each other. And I, I love learning from people. I think um, uh, it's, it's the best way to learn um, is through someone else's experience. And uh, you just got to give them a platform. And so that's what I did. Um, and uh, every year I have keynote speakers that come in that are really disrupting the space. And that year um, I actually uh, was a executive producer on a project with Jeffrey Harmon, who um, you'll get to know here in a second, um, on a, on a um, basically a, a live nativity. Basically it was a, an effort where we're bringing everyone together and we wanted to break a world record in a, um, kind of letting the world know about Jesus, that it's not commercialism through uh, uh, Christmas, but it was an effort of, hey, it's more about him and, and the essence of uh, the birth. And so we did, did a music video with the piano guys and the Mormon Tabernacle Choir, and we had like 12,000 or 1,200 people come in, and we broke the world record, and it was a very impactful thing. And then uh, six months later, we did a uh, television uh, a commercial uh, for Squatty Potty, um, for the pooping unicorn. So the pooping unicorn, <laughs> Jesus, it all works. It all right. works. <laughs> but anyway, so um, fast forward to Vid Summit. Uh, I believe that um, people need to be inspired by case study. And so I asked Jeffrey, he would, he would speak at Vid Summit and uh, we would co-present on the case study of Squatty Potty. Um, and, and we did. And, and it, everybody loved it at the conference. And the next year I was putting it on, I always do an invite uh, to anyone that does a keynote to always come back. And he goes, well, I can't this year. I'm starting up a, uh, a new venture called, you know, um, Angel Studios. Uh, it was been Angel before. Okay. Um, and I got so much that's going on. I can't be a part of it. I'd love to, but, you know, just don't, t don't count on me. So I go putting on my conference and uh, <laughs> we're, we're having thousands of people there. And I get this text from Jeffrey and it says, hey, are you still, is my ticket still good? And I says, yeah, it's still good. He goes, I'll be there. Um, I'll be there in a couple hours. And so he got on a plane from Provo to, to L.A. And, and went to the conference. And here I am trying to navigate uh, putting on a conference. You know how it can get a little hectic. With a little busy. Little fires that you have yeah, to put out yeah. everywhere. Um, and uh, he, he approached me. He says, Daryl, I need you to come watch this video. I'm like, did you just fly all the way from Utah to L.A. <laughs> to show me a video? Haven't you ever heard of email? Like there's a thing called email, right? He goes, no, but you need to see this. And this is what I love about Jeffrey is he wouldn't let it go. I'm like, dude, I put it on a conference. I could do it maybe tonight. Yeah. He's like, no, you need to do it now. Right now. And I go, I can't. I, I, I literally am being pulled in so many different directions. I'm trying to orchestrate this whole event. He goes, no, you need to do it now. And I says, okay. I walked away and I just kind of shrugging him off <laughs> a little bit. And I, I take like three steps and it stopped. I stopped and it hit me. I'm like, he just traveled a long ways to come show me a video. The least I can do is go watch it right now. Yeah. And I turned to him and says, how long is it? He says, 18 minutes. Uh. I go, okay, it's good. So I went and found a room. Um, it was just a, about a table about this size in a very, very small uh, uh, conference room at the hotel. 
and he pulls out his Chromebook. It was like eight inches. I'm like, you expect me to watch something on this? Like eight inches? Come on. He goes, yeah, you're going to love it. And it's like the most horrible sound or whatever. Right, right. And that was the first time I watched the short film that Dallas made for the Christmas Eve services of his church called The Shepherd. Yeah. And I watched it and I go, oh, um, really low budget, like extremely low budget. <laughs> um, but I'm a, I'm a sucker for audience development. I'm a sucker for um, character development. I'm a sucker for human dynamics. Okay. And I'm like, this is really good. I, I would yeah, never yeah. ever looked at the perspective of a shepherd. Right. Um, and seeing some something through his eyes. I'm like, man, what? And back in my mind, I'm like, what? What an amazing storyteller, yeah. first off. Yeah, yeah. And then there was a moment that hit me is the shepherd was just wanting to learn about the Messiah. And, and here he was, went into the synagogue. And at that moment, he got kicked out because he was unclean. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And all he wanted to do was learn. Right. And then what I love and I love about the storytelling was what happened next. Yeah. What happened next was someone asked for his help, says, hey, do you know where the well's at? Right, right. And that was Joseph right. and Mary was on the donkey. And I'm like, wow, holy cow, this is so good. <laughs> and, and he was like, wait, 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 wait. He was like, tell him where the, the, the uh, well was. And then he reached down and he gave him his water. Yeah. And it, I, I just lost it. I was like, man, like how symbolic is that? Like here, here you are right before Jesus is being born. You're giving the water to the person that's going to bring the water that you won't thirst anymore. Yeah. I'm like, wow, like so how powerful, powerful is that? And then I get a, a really a, 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 a abrupt knock on the door. And they says, Daryl, we need you. And I get up and I, I start to walk out. And Jeffrey says, you know, you haven't seen the good part yet. And I'm like, like, I can't. I'm trying to put on a conference. Is he in the room with He's you? He's in on the room watching it. And I says, I, I turn and I, and I looked at him. I says, I know where this is going. And I, I, I says, I have to be a part of this. And I, I don't care if I just hold the light. I want to be a part of this. Wow. Wow. And he goes, good. I need you to meet this creator this next week. And so um, we finished out the conference on a Friday. Um, I got on a plane, came up to Provo, and I met Dallas for the first time. And meeting Dallas for the first time uh, was a little off-putting because he's a lot taller in person <laughs> than what you expect. I'm like, wow, you're pretty tall. He's like, wow, you're pretty fat. But anyway, <laughs> but, but, anyway um, but we we hit it off, and he shared his vision uh, for a TV show. And, and that's where I felt led and prepared to help him with his vision. Uh-huh. And uh, he shared, um, and he was saying words that I, I have, I've always carried in my heart. Yeah. Like, we gotta disrupt things. We need to be authentic. We need to be transparent. We need to, we need to do this in a, in a great way, you know, where it's gathering and, and, and really just really focusing in on the life and ministry of Jesus. So I'm like, okay, you, you got me. You had me at authenticity, you know? Right, right. And um, right then and there, um, we, we uh, Dallas and I started the company. We had wow. zero money in the bank and mm-hmm. zero social following, but we had a great idea and his vision of where he wanted to see the show. And I'm like, I, I'm all over this. And then my background, just a little bit, is I've literally built audiences my whole career. And I'm like, I know what I can contribute. I know what, where I can bring my loaves and fishes yeah. And I know what he has. What I can't do is make content like him. I right, can't, right. but I know how to, how to make it shine. Yeah. I know how to get it a little bit more attracted um, to the audience of, right. of general public. And I says, okay, this is going to be a great dynamic. And um, the next uh, year and a half to two years, it was like crawling on glass the whole time. Wow. And wow. Uh, that's, that's how I got to know mm-hmm. Dallas. I know we'll go a lot more in depth on some of the questions that you have, yeah. but um, it, it, I felt, I, I, I felt that I was introduced to a brother, a brother in Christ, um, but also a brother in this life. Um, and we complement each other mm-hmm. and, um, in, in so many different ways, like he's on this side, I'm on that side and it just, it meshed really well. Yeah. Um, and, and the thing that I can honestly say from the beginning is his goals has always been my goals of my heart. Like it always has. It's like it de- hasn't deviated of what we want to achieve. Now I might be a little bit more literal um, to that. I like I do believe in certain things of getting the chosen out to a billion people, and I don't say that figuratively. Right, I really right, do mean right, that, right? Um, because it has impact. And yeah. So that's kind of where it all started. 
it started from uh, Dallas creating content that projected light. And, and I had to go, I was gathered by that light. And then at that moment, I realized that that light, that, that piece of content needs to be, go out to more people because it's going to gather. Um, and that's, that's how, we, how we met. I just have a quick follow-up yeah. before we head over to Brad, but was there any initial conversation of like, wait, I'm evangelical, you're LDS, just at the very beginning? Yeah, um, I, I do believe that Dallas um, had a lot of people telling him that he would be crazy to uh, start a business with, with uh, someone that's LDS and a dis, you know someone um, distributing it that is LDS, right? Um, but this is what I love about Dallas. He was able to see my heart, and he's been the biggest defender of me and my family Amen. and my faith background. And he's literally had to endure stuff that. No one should endure, yeah, because of our relationship. And honestly, I'll always be eternally indebted to him because of how he's defended me and my beliefs. And um, and on the flip side, he will say other things, you know, of how we've helped him, you know, and it's just been very synergistic, yeah, yeah, of a project, yeah. So. Sounds like something God would do. Yes. yes. Yeah. It's so powerful. And and I would think it's fair to say that our audience, it's a smaller audience uh, by, by uh, obvious uh, reality there. But our, a lot of our folks know that I come from an LDS background, that I'm very passionate about Mormon evangelical dialogue or LDS evangelical dialogue, and that I've been involved with Robert Millett of BYU and various general authorities of the LDS church. And we've brought people like Rabbi Zacharias and Nick Vujicic uh, to speak in the letter to St. Tabernacle on Temple Square over the years. And we've seen some incredible things happen. Um, that story that you just told is quintessential to what I think God's up to. It's, it's not about the debate. It's not about the black and white right now, we are really seeing the power of relationship. And if you just get to know somebody, it doesn't mean that the doctrine is not important anymore or that somehow it's all about compromising. I'll trade the Trinity in for salvation by grace alone. If you'll, you know, it's not about that. It's about knowing somebody and seeking God in his fullness together. And when that happens, when we enter into relationship, I think, uh, Again, not the doctrine or, or, or theological compromise is is the next step. It's not. I've heard Dallas say that in various uh, different uh, director vlogs that he's done, that it's not about compromise. It's about building relationship. And that, that story just... Well, it started brings, day one with that. Yeah. And I can't wait to share with you what happened in Jerusalem uh, with us specifically. Wow. Um, that led to where we're at today. I do believe, though, is... Um, what happened in first century when, when Jesus was starting to gather, people had to think a little bit differently. Yeah. Um, yes. And, yes. and uh, we, we come with baggage as, as people. We have a lot of baggage, um, whether it's a religious background, <laughs> you know, it, yeah, it, it might absolutely. even be, it might even be um, tendencies of family dynamics um, or things that were imposed upon us. We all come with that, that baggage and it changes or warps our perception of what reality really is. Yeah, yeah. And the only way that we can have clarity of reality is have clarity of the source. The source is Jesus Christ. And then once we have that, that clarity will lift the shroud of fog mm -hmm. from mm -hmm. our mind. Mm -hmm. And it, we realize that, do you know what? A lot of the stuff that we, we thought isn't necessarily true. But what true is, is truth. Amen. And that's what Jesus taught. Yeah. Yeah. And I and I think that's that's the gathering moment. And so I think that the, the God al always will do what God does because He knows all. I don't know all. Mm -hmm. I just found that the more that I get out of the way, that <laughs> that He'll He'll lead it. You know, at different times of the project, that we can get that much closer of accomplishing His will. Yeah, yeah. Hey, Brad. Before we come your way, help me out with one thing, Daryl, on the timeline. When when was the shepherd? 
actually play? What Christmas was that? It was that okay. 2017 or is that? So it was four years ago. Okay. Um, is when, when it was played. Um, in, in, in Dallas's church. Oh, it would have been five years ago in Dallas's church. So that would have been 216 then? Uh, 17. 17. Okay. Yep. So 2017. And then kind of, it. how did it get from that night to Bit Angel, which is now Angel Studio? Yeah, I love that. Um, so there there was a, um, a PR uh, person that is in interface. His name is Matthew Faraci. He's a okay. Messianic Jew. Okay. Uh, wh- whose friends with Dallas saw it. And he says, hey, do you mind if I show this to some brothers in Utah that are starting up this studio. He just knew him. For, Yeah, he was yeah, doing the okay. PR work for Oh, okay, gotcha. He goes, do you mind if I, if I show him? So that's how it started there. Jeffrey saw it and was moved by it and then showed Neil. And Neil's like, we ain't going to start a studio over a Jesus show. <laughs> and as soon as they, Neil says, we got to do it, then the first thing that, that Jeffrey thought was, well, we can't build this as a business. We need to surround him by people that we know and trust um, who do we know and trust? And they, they first thought of me because it's like what we were trying to do from the beginning is get the crowd involved to fund it. Yeah. Yeah. And why wouldn't you go to someone that's built a career, you know, yeah. developing crowds to, to help you do that. So awesome. pretty, pretty amazing. Yeah. Let, we'll, we'll come back to that. To yeah. Let's sit. Oh, poor I'm, neglected Brad. <laughs> <laughs> I'm enjoying the story. <laughs> well, you got a story to tell too. I, I do I've heard a, a little bit of it. So yeah, no. please uh, share with us. How you so I just don't like crawling on glass. So I came later. <laughs> They'd finished the grass glass crawl. What they didn't tell me is they were just starting the nail walk. <laughs> so it was a year and a half. Ago. Uncle's is next. <laughs> was like, wonderful, wonderful. Um, so it was a year and a half ago. I was living in New York City with my family, and the COVID pandemic hit us. And my wife's not a fan of sitting in her apartment all day for months. And so we came out to Utah. Uh, where we had spent time, we both had been raised here in Utah. Our grandchildren at this point were in Utah. And so it was like, let's go where we can be with family. So we were here, um, sequestered up in the mountains at a resort, just sort of staying away from everybody. When um, when my wife came in and said, you know that show I showed you in New York City that we watched that you liked called The Chosen? Well, the guy that's making it, just made a post and he said they're looking for a place to make season two. Oh my goodness. And uh, we watched the the social post together and and uh, she said, you know, what about the Goshen set that the LDS church owns? And um, I, I had some familiarity with that set and the people who managed it. And I reached out uh, actually through Jeff Harmon to get an introduction to Dallas. And he introduced us, and I invited Dallas to come to Utah and uh, just really said, let's, let's just go drive out and look at this set. Daryl was with us that day, and we, we drove to Goshen, and we walked the set. And if you've, well, you've seen it in season two, so you know it's just spectacular. Okay. Um, and as we drove away that day and kind of shared in the car our feelings about what we had just seen, we couldn't help but wonder you know, why would this be built if not for a project like this? We know the church had used it for a decade for good purposes, right? Bible videos, but it sat fairly dormant at this point. And so we began uh, the process of just asking permission for use of that set. And, and we were told emphatically we couldn't use it. And what we didn't know is that uh, many organizations, many productions had asked for permission to use it and had been turned down over the years for various reasons. Um, but, you know, we still didn't quite tick the boxes. And I, I, I think to be just sort of transparent about what was going on, it was a combination of we're in the COVID period right. and there's a lot of sensitivity to sponsor anything that's yeah, going to bring yeah. people together. And also, um, the church built it for its own purposes, and it needed the flexibility to kind of use it whenever they wanted. Right. And um, and so, uh, I, I won't give you the blow by blow because it was a long path. But uh, you know, we we finally got to the point where we had been told no enough that many it, times. <laughs> many times <laughs> that that it took our wives, frankly, to set us straight. Um, I, in fact, uh, Dallas and I have this video of 
I'm, I'm driving down Provo Canyon and my wife's in the seat and I just received word again that no, you can't use the set. And I announced that to my wife and she said, hand me the phone. And I handed her the phone and she posted a video to Dallas and she said, I know God's going to let you use that set. Don't give up faith. And that was exactly what his wife, Amanda, was telling him. Uh, but we didn't know what that path looked like. Yeah, and so yeah. there were a series of events at the most inopportune time, frankly. Um, the general authorities of the church were all away on vacation for a month in the summer. It's their tradition. And we needed to get an answer right during the heart of that month. And uh, we knew we kind of needed to work around the naysayers to get that yes. And... Um, through a series of people, not not just me, other people who were sort of trying to help us figure this out, we were able to get a meeting with a couple of the apostles, um, and Dallas and I kind of made our case. Um, Dallas makes a case really well because <laughs> he's just completely surrendered. I remember him saying uh, to these two elders, he said, this is your set. God's entrusted it to you. I'm not going to tell you it's mine or that you should say yes to me. I'm simply going to say, if God intends me to use it, he'll let you know. And we'll just leave it at that. Yeah, yeah. So he's completely surrendered in that yeah, moment. Yeah. And I think that uh, humility, frankly, where he wasn't just pitching them, uh, gave them permission maybe to trust a little bit more. Because if you if we all trust the same God, then let him work with us. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, 72 hours later, we received word that we were going to be able to use the set. Um, and it, it, it truly was miraculous. Even other people at the church were calling Daryl and I saying, how did you do that? <laughs> you know, we can't even get our own church productions on that set during this period of time. Yeah, but yeah. we were able to do that. So um, remember, I'm just a fan at that point. I'm not looking for a job and certainly want to be the a big fan and a cheerleader for what they're doing. But in the course of getting to know Daryl and Dallas and, and the Harmon brothers at Angel Studios, it just became clear that there are some things that I could do to help out. Wow. And so a few months later, I was invited to first join Angel Studios, where I acted as chief distribution officer for about a year. And then subsequently have moved over to The Chosen now, where I'm providing my gifts and my kind of experience in life to help move this forward. Yeah. I would love for you to add to that the the story of the dedication prayer that you were told about at, at Goshen. Yeah, well, just a beautiful thing. Um, there, when, when any uh, significant facility, a temple, chapel, and, and uh, sometimes office buildings are, are funded by the church, uh, they'll offer a dedicatory prayer, essentially giving it back to the Lord. This is for your work, your purposes. And so when this Goshen set was built at great cost, uh, an apostle was asked to come and, and dedicate that as well. And unbeknownst to any of us through this process, um, one of the apostles we had been meeting with had received that assignment to dedicate the Goshen set. And uh, I happened to be out on my bicycle uh, on, a, on an early morning and uh, rode my bike past the home, the residence of, of this apostle, and he was out in the front yard. And, um, and so I just swung by, took off my helmet so he could recognize me and say hi to him. And, and he said, Brad, I want to just share one thing with you. He said, uh, this really didn't come up in any of the discussions, but I just want you to know that when I dedicated that site, that facility, what came into my mind and the words I spoke, they don't publish their remarks uh, or, or blessings in that moment, but he said uh, it was very clear that this facility would be used by people not of our faith to tell stories of Jesus. Wow. And, uh, and we were the first organization outside of the faith tradition to be invited to use that facility. Now, I imagine it'll be used over the years by people of many faith traditions to tell Jesus stories, but it was uh, really a confirmation to me that this was a God thing. This yeah. wasn't anything we were making happen. He had some plan. Now, when, when was that set officially completed? It's uh, been 11 years now. So that takes us back about 210. Yeah. 
It's interesting, Dr. George Wood, who's the former general superintendent of the Assemblies of God International, <clears throat> through a, a fostering of relationship with Elder Jeffrey Holland, they've become very good friends. And uh, Elder Holland and Elder Cook actually hosted Dr. Wood and a number of us for a lovely dinner in 2012. And they presented uh, a series, uh, a short series of video clips of various New Testament stories or parables that had been filmed there. And I can remember the gentleman from Public Affairs kind of talking to, you know, Dr. Wood and myself and the others that were of the evangelical community uh, at this meeting because we were kind of sharing and giving gifts to each other and whatnot. And uh, and that was the first time that I learned about this Jerusalem set. So that would have been 2012. I know that yeah. for a fact. And And I know that at some point in that conversation, this gentleman mentioned to Dr. Wood, you know, the uh, candidly, you know, a, a movement of probably 65 to 70 million uh, adherents of the Assemblies of God internationally and worldwide, uh, that, that this set would be available to, uh, to others to use as well. It was just a passing reference. And so when you told that story the other night to me on the phone, I remember thinking, I remember that was stated uh, that night that this, this set would be available, but then you said it kind of got caught up in minutia and bureaucracy and things like that. Where, so where that, were you all along? <laughs> <laughs> I was like banging my head against the wall and you had all this knowledge. No, What's going on here? I mean, I only, it only connects now though, yeah. you know, because we have a very similar story. Um, you know, after the 2002 Winter Olympics here in Utah, there was a lot of angst between yeah. the evangelical community and the other saint community. A lot of traditional Christians and Protestants were coming into Utah to, to denounce Mormonism and, and uh, come against it during the Olympics because they felt that this was a world stage and whatnot. And a number of us uh, literally came, came down, long story short, to 2003, Standing Together hosted a meeting with pastors to, to respond to what happens at General Conference every single time. That uh, There's this big, bombastic, you know, antagonistic uh, expression. And so a number of us said, that is not who we are. We don't appreciate that confrontational spirit, that that vitriol. And so in 2004, we had a press conference and we spoke to it and we got a lot of criticism from these, these folks that like to do that during general conference. And as we moved forward, um, we kind of stood the course, took our hits, and then we ended up doing something called Mission Loving Kindness in 2004 in April and October, where we as evangelical traditional Christians went down to uh, Temple Square and kind of stood on the the sidewalk. We actually got permits from the city of Salt Lake, mm -hmm. and we did something called Mission Loving Kindness, where as Latter-day Saints walked to, to their conference, rather than being yelled at, people of various evangelical traditions, all identified on a badge, um, basically uh, would be said, hey, have a great day. God bless you. Have a nice conference, you know, and uh, and they were just shocked. And, and the journey of that eventually led to a letter that I read, uh, that I wrote to President Hinckley at the time about a forthcoming Ravi Zacharias trip to Utah where we were going to have him speak at the University of Utah, Weber State, and at BYU. And out of nowhere, this idea came up, I wonder if the LDS Church would ever let us use the tabernacle on Temple Square. And I'm telling you, all the people in public affairs and all the contacts I had at BYU were saying, oh, great idea, great idea. We'll get back to you. We'll get back to you. We'll get back to you. And nothing, you know, so it was falling flat. That letter to President Hinckley upon the death of his wife, Marjorie, where I wrote him a condolence letter and said, P.S., we have this thing. Is there any chance? And that was not the intention of the letter. The letter was to, to, to truly offer condolence to the uh, LDS Church uh, president on the loss of his uh, beloved wife, I think of some 60 years at the time. And uh, it really was just pulled on my heart that, to do that. And then at the end, I just said, well... If he reads this letter, maybe he'll read this too. And so um, within days, literally, we had a letter from the uh, president, uh, from the uh, secretary to the first presidency saying, Fran Benke will be your your uh, helper at, uh, at the tabernacle. It's yours. Mm -hmm. And I thought... Well, had I only known, you just got to go to our letter. <laughs> <laughs> we even had to crawl in glass for a year and a half. <laughs> it's crazy. We, in a, in a hierarchical organizations, uh, getting to the top can really be effective, yes. can it? So, <laughs> but that's an amazing story. And I, I just shared that other part just to kind of say, uh, yeah, when, uh, when God decides it's going to happen, it well, happens. What I love about this, and this is something for me, uh, just sitting back, we needed to shoot season one in Texas. We did. 
there we it, like we tried to get it in Goshen. Like I shot music videos there, um, and I'm like, we we can we can do this. I like, got if there's ever a person that can make this happen, that would be me. And little did I know that I can't do anything. <laughs> but but it was it needed to be shot in Texas, and um, and it wasn't until uh, it was time. You know, I do see wisdom now um, of doing it God's way. It's just yeah. like getting it out of the way. Cause like yeah. here we had this beautiful set and I'd have my hopes and dreams all, uh, you know, set on it and it wasn't the time. It wasn't right. It wasn't the way, you know, and it was the moment that we decided, okay, that's out of the picture that all these other opportunities open up. And then even when we got told no nine times, yeah. then it actually came, came through. Yeah. So, yeah. And, and it doesn't mean even when you get, the official permission uh, that that all is smooth sailing. Oh, um, no. Not at all. Ravi, literally at that time in September of that year, just uh, we had the event in November of of two thousand four, the first one, and uh, he pulled out in two thousand four because of some pressure he was receiving from the evangelical world, yeah. and we were like, "No, you cannot." Pull. I mean, it was you talk about a stressful night uh, for me. So I finally got a hold of him in Connecticut, and we talked it through. And you talk about the power of our wives, okay? So Ravi had written a letter to President Hinckley to say, this can't, this can't happen, I'm so sorry, you know, thank you, but no thank you. Gave it to his wife, Margie, and said, hey, mail this for me, before talking with me about all this. So then I convinced him later that day that he should stay the course and that you should pre prevail through this, uh, through this persecution and this opposition. And he agrees to do so, and he says, but I wrote a letter. And I, and I said, what, what, what letter did you write? <laughs> he tells me this letter. I said, no, go get it. Retract it. He said, it's already mailed. And lo and behold, Margie had not mailed it on purpose <laughs> because she did not agree with Ravi's decision and wanted to hold back for a few days. And because of that, it was never sent. And like your wife saying to, to Dallas, I believe this is going to happen. Don't give up. So thank so you. What's the moral thank you, Jill. Of the story? <laughs> Listen to your wife. Come on, Greg. There you go. I'm good. At it. You know, I'd like to kind of move into yeah. a direction here. We've talked about um, just the relationships between evangelicals and, and LDS. And I'd love to hear from both of you if you, prior to being a part of the Chosen, if you had relationships with people that were of, even of a different faith than your own and maybe spe more specifically evangelicals and what that looked like and how the chosen has maybe changed that a little bit. And, and maybe in this segment, uh, your relationship with Dallas can be talked about a yeah, little bit. Yeah, sure, sure. I'll guess I go first. Um, so one of the things I had an aha moment in my career of what I was put on earth to do. Uh, before it was just like, I was really interested in doing content that people would talk about. And, um, you know, I, I thought that meant Super Bowl commercials or something of that magnitude. But then came along YouTube and I realized, hey, you can do, you know, content that people can talk about and things can go viral. And, and I, I discovered YouTube in uh, 2005 mm -hmm. and build a career around it. And I, I became a name. Um, there was a point in my career where I'm like, okay, I'm doing this and I'm having a lot of fun and people are talking about the content. This is great. But what, in, what real impact are, are we having? Mm. And at that time, I started to notice that th there's some careers that are going on where these YouTubers would be in front of, of people and they would influence them. And, um, and, and whether it's good or bad, I just noticed that they had a, a power of influence and they had a stage that didn't have very many limits. And, and so... Um, I decided at the moment was um, I wanted to really become an expert in that audience development portion because nobody was doing it. I saw an opportunity there. I saw a venue. And then I saw the reality. The reality was is there's people on YouTube that are not good influences, that they actually are, are net negative creators that are bringing more filth and darkness mm -hmm. into the world. Mm -hmm. And there needs to be someone on the opposite side helping people that have light. And the moment that it clicked for me was, and everything's around light, but it was more, more about finding people that had gifts from God and, and things to create um, and, and helping them accentuate their light. Because I could see the light. I could see all these amazing videos, wow. but they didn't have views on it. No, no audience, but yeah. it's like very impactful things. And I'm like, man, 
you know, they need to have someone help them navigate the marketing and the strategy and the audience development. And so the moment that I, I went on that journey, um, I found that it's a lot easier to amplify light when there's light. <laughs> there you go. You can't amplify light in darkness. It's just if they're, if they're, if they're to their core, if they're not true, if they're not authentic and they're not real and, and, and it just doesn't, it doesn't go. I mean, you can use other gifts that, that, that Satan uses to convince and deceive, but that's not what I'm about. And right, so right. the moment that I did that, so where it led to was looking out in an industry of who was, who, who had that light mm. and whose content that I was actually uplifted by maybe not like spiritually, but it was like, uh, there was an entertainment, but it was wholesome entertainment. Yeah. And that's where I led uh, a career and, and, and started with musicians, piano guys to, you know, studio C and then really led to a lot of uh, evangelical Christians that, that are on YouTube um, and, and even going to the biggest YouTuber of all time, um, which is Mr. Beast and, and his mom is devout e evangelical and he was, uh, raised in that household, he doesn't necessarily agree with everything that his mom does, but he he was he was uh, born in there. But like his content is good in the sense that it's it's giving to people, um, and and it's a sense of of wholesomeness that that I believe the world needs to see is just hey, think about other people more than yourself, and um, and regardless of of that, I said that's kind of the career that I built and. I just found that it was easier to identify people. And I, I felt like God was leading me to people that he prepared to be a creator of light. So that moment with Dallas was, was I was already in the habit of looking. And so when you're looking, it's easier to find. Mm -hmm. um, and as soon as I saw him, I just, I just knew it. I felt in my bones, in my spirit, in my soul, that we were meant to do something, you know? And um, I wanna fast forward a little bit because there was a couple moments of, of really good clarity for me. The first one was when we first met, but as we decided, hey, let's see if this is gonna work. So we, we met um, in October, um, formed the business in October and we- Is that 217? It'd be 218. Okay, 218, okay. Um, and uh, we just released the, the Shepherd and we wanted to gauge interest so that we can go apply with the Securities Exchange Commission to do, take public money okay. and do an offering where we can bring public money in and, and you know, fund the show. And um, very big success in the sense of awareness. Okay. Uh, we still didn't have dollars coming in because they couldn't apply until we went through the whole process. Um, and then going into that, that spring, we, Dallas and I felt that we needed a moment um, to go to the Holy Land. Neither of us have been to the Holy Land. And I'm like, hey, how can you start a show? You know, Dallas, how can you write a show about Jesus if you've never been to the Holy Land? And so uh, we, we felt led to, to go. And so um, we had a Messianic rabbi, Rabbi Jason Sobel, yeah. um, that does tours out there that says, hey, I'd, I'd be more than willing to do it. And it's going to cost you this amount of money, but I'd, I'd be more than happy to be your guide, which we love because then we're not on this big bus or yeah. anything like that. It, it could be very... Uh, personal and and Dallas wanted to um, walk where the disciples walked. He wanted to go to Capernaum. He wanted to go to Magdala. You know, wanted to go uh, there. And uh, we we get in. It was a very very long flight. Um, and we get in. We got to the Sea of Galilee. Um, and waking up the next morning in the Sea of Galilee was one of the most breathtaking moments of my life of just seeing that and just like oh, I'm here. You know. Yeah. And then. We went to go shoot a video because the whole purpose of it was to do research and shoot videos to raise money. And we get to the Sea of Galilee, getting ready for our, our first shoot. Um, and just prior to that, we had a, a prayer uh, where the Sermon on the Mount was. And we're like, well, how, how great is that? You know, and, <laughs> and Rabbi Jason offered it. We actually recorded it. It's online. I was going to say, I've seen that. That is yeah, an incredible moment. Beautiful, beautiful yeah. moment. And so we decided to go down closer to the Sea of Galilee. And I'm just, in my mind, I'm just like going through all the Bible stories and all, you know, the gospels of everything that happened here. And I'm, I'm just like a kid in a candy store because I, I love history. I love culture. I love people. And I'm like, I, I'm, I'm in my element here. And, and I just, there's just this peacefulness in that land. Uh, the reason why they call it the Holy Land, it must be. So we're getting all set up to, to shoot the video. And I, I look 
over there and there's like a first century boat that's just floating on the Sea of Galilee. And I go, hey, rabbi. He's like, yeah, like, come here. He comes over and he says, what's up? I go, how, how, how often have you come to Jerusalem? And he goes, I've been here, you know, maybe eight or 10 times over the last 20 years, every year, eight or 10 times a year. And I says, have you ever seen this? And it was a first century boat. And he goes, well, no, that, that's really, really quite odd. And then at that moment, there was a, a net that was cast there. They were going to fish like first century. And then he stopped and he goes, this is a symbol of wow. what the chosen can be. Wow. wow. And he goes, do you remember the parable of the, the nets and the fishes? And I says, yes, I do. It's my, actually my favorite, one of my favorite parables and of what Jesus taught. And he goes, he goes, what was the underlying message of that? It's like, we're here to gather and Jesus's role is to sort yeah. it out later. Yeah. And he goes, that is what the chosen can be. Yeah. And I'll tell you what, it hit me to the core of, you know what? If we use this, if we get out of the way and just do what he wants us to do, which is to gather. Mm -hmm. And that means Dallas needs to perform at his highest base because I ain't writing the show. <laughs> you know, he is because God gave him those gifts. And then um, that was a very, very impactful thing for me because I felt like I, I knew gathering. I built a career on gathering. And now it was like, oh, here's the symbolism of the show and the gathering. Yeah. And I'm like, oh, this is going to be so great. And I, yeah. I could feel that charge. Yeah. I, I don't know if you ever felt the charge before. You're like, okay. Like it was solidified in my soul that I was here to help gather. Um, and I want to say help gather because I'm not doing the gathering. It's just helping you know, Jesus do his work. Um, and then later that day, we, you know, where we were at, we went to Magdala and they just unearthed a, a first century synagogue. And I can guarantee you that first century synagogue, there's a high probability that Jesus walked those halls, just knowing that that's that. And they just unearthed it. And I got super emotional and I'm like, man, this is just, this is just something um, beautiful. And I was just thinking of, of Mary and I was thinking of, of a lot of misconceptions um, because of history of who Mary is. I'm like, we don't really know who she is, but yet she was the one that was a devout follower, but also witnessed Jesus after his resurrection. I'm like, man, and Dallas had a moment where he just knew he needed to get Mary right. He needed to get the disciples right. right, right. And he needed to, to really put the due diligence. And I can honestly say, the um, demeanor of Dallas changed that day because, mm. and I truly do believe this, is because these people actually lived and had personalities and they had relationships and they had families, but it's never really been shared. You share a little right, piece right, here or right, there, right. but not the dynamics. Mm -hmm. And they needed to know what would be plausible in that scenario. And, and I think that was the moment that he felt the weight, but also the moment that he felt the surrender, because you know what? God told him, and he didn't tell me this till after, he says, hey, I'm gonna let you mess this up, <laughs> but, but you gotta get this right. Um, but I think it's the moment that he could take it before the Lord and his process of coming up with the content um, is, 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 is through a lot of thought and prayer and a lot of discussion with amazing co-writers, you know, and it, it's not a debate on you know what should we you know cover in the bible it's like we're we're here to really help people discover an authentic jesus yeah. and how would it be what would be plausible in that moment to happen and what i love is here we were just the next hour we were in capernaum and i'm like holy cow uh, like i was just envisioning everything that was going on and like you know the dynamics and says you know this is where Peter lived. This yeah. is where Peter's mother-in-law was. So we know that Peter was married, you know, and Andrew was there and they worked together. And James <laughs> and John, sons of Zebedee, were right down the street. And here was a, a publican who was a Jew, who was a traitor from the things. And it was this is small little neighborhood. I know. And it was going on. I'm like, man, this is going to be so good. Because I, can, I can envision this. And, and Dallas is going through. He says, he started to talk about, um, you know, who, who do you really resonate with in the Bible? I'm like, I, I, I'm a Peter, you know, I'm, I'm impulsive. I, I like to, to take things head on. 
And he goes, yeah, yeah. And he goes, I can see that. You know, he always says, stuff like, I can see that. You know? <laughs> <laughs> what are you saying here? But it was those moments of, of clarity and connection. And then what happened next was uh, Dallas went back and, and met with the writers and started to developing the script treatment. You know, and, and I want to make this very clear. Um, Dallas takes the highest sensitivity to the content um, more than I've ever seen in any other creator that I've ever worked with. He's more sensitive about the product because it, it, of what it is, what it yeah, represents. Yeah. And um, I've seen him come up with ideas that were great ideas that could be interwoven and it just didn't feel right. Yeah, yeah. So he went a, a non-traditional way because it felt right. Yeah. I mean, come on, putting Matthew on spectrum. Right. Right. Like, come, who does that? <laughs> <laughs> who does that? And yet the moment that you get a sense of what's going on there, you go, that could totally work. That well, I but, get it. I, I could I see can that. I can see why, because yeah. like all the genealogy, like, you know, and I love that little, that little face is like, I, I would make it more detailed. Would, you know, you got to have the, the genealogy, you know, but, but no, but that's the, the beauty of Dallas is, He'll, he'll go through it, work through it, and everyone has their skill sets. And, and everyone praises Dallas for his writing, but I want to praise Tyler Thompson yeah. and I want to praise Ryan Swanson. Right, right. Who, Ryan Swanson's the, the head writer and the co-writers are, are Dallas and Tyler, but they all bring a different element. And this is the beauty that I love about this is because there's they're like a trifecta of, of amazing content because Ryan is really good at, at plots and, and really connect, uh, doing scenarios in content. And Tyler's really good at, um, you know, the religious aspect of monologues and meaning and, and whatever. And then Dallas is really good at human relationships mm. and that dynamic, mm. but also he has a good understanding of religious undertones and overtones in the connection. Yeah. Um, but a uh, little secret though is Dallas always writes script three, the, the third episode of every season by himself, and they don't have a plot. None of them have a plot because <laughs> there's no Ryan involved with it. But there's a lot of human, there's a lot of human elements. You look at season uh, three. With the children. Or, yeah, yeah. yeah. So I'm sorry. Uh, uh, episode three. Episode three of season three, one. Season yeah, one there you go. Of the children. Yeah. There's no plot there. <laughs> like what's the plot? And then two. I do believe this is by far my favorite episode of The Chosen, which is uh, season two, episode three, where it felt like church. Um, everybody's like, oh, you know, I follow Jesus this way and I do it this way. And, you know, everyone has their background and baggage and there's contention. And here is the son of man out there killing the people of Samaria into the night and all through the day. Yeah. And comes in and is physically, spiritually, emotionally wrecked. And here they were just nagging. Yeah. Mm. And, and it set them in their place. Yeah. And I love what yeah. happens next. It's just this my favorite thing of all time is a mother who felt like she didn't, couldn't help was able to serve at the time of need. And that service of just helping them get ready for the bed. You could just see the emotion um, and Jonathan did a great job at portraying that, but it's just like, wow. And it's like, that's why I love Dallas's writing is because I, I dig those, those yeah. conversations and he's, he's a conversationalist in that regard, but there's yeah. no plot. Yeah. <laughs> so. You know, and, and of course, uh, maybe not everybody would know this, but certainly, uh, many in the evangelical world would know that Dallas's father is a prolific author, yep. uh, uh, you know, and, and had one of the most famous series book series on the end times in modern you know, writing and, uh, and many, many people, including my, my departed father was deeply affected, you know, and, and, and they're debated, you know, the end times is a, is a controversial You're topic. Affected you know. or offended. That's like, there's just no middle ground. <laughs> well, my, my dad who never read anything, read every single one yeah. of those left behind books. And he was, uh, he, his faith in God was strengthened. And you just wonder what kind of influence I know Jerry's been a little bit involved with some writing stuff with, with his son, but you know, certainly he learned something from his father about storytelling and relationship and, and, and that influence is there, but it, it's just kind of a cool thing to see how um, Dallas has emerged with, with these same gifts and, and can apply them in more of a visual format than in just writing. But I, I want to make it clear. Okay. I think God prepares us for what, what, what he's given us. Right. Mm -hmm. 
Um, and this is a really important thing, and I think it, it helps with the nature and the name of your podcast too, is, is if we're going to take it on alone, it's never going to be what it can be. And, and Dallas is a great writer when he has complimentary co-writers that keep yeah. him in check. Excellent. Good point. And, and that's what we need, whether it's in a personal relationship that we have with our wives or husbands or whatever, whatever scenario, you need to have someone to keep you in check because if we just do it our way, We'll never do it God's way. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. I love yeah. how, you know, when you see Dallas talking, he went through some really tough stuff and some failures to get to the point that where he is. And I think it's, it's those things that really make us humble. And, um, and so we pray regularly for, for Dallas and, and the rest of the crew that they would stay humble yeah. because we all need that. We all need to stay in a place of realizing we need each other that God has gifted us in different ways. And the moment we try to go off on our own and, and do it and feel like I've got it all together and, and I know what I'm doing yeah. is the moment that failure typically comes Yeah, because yeah. God is not in that. Well, I can tell you um, this journey has been, you, you've taken a lot of, of very opinionated people and you put them together to try to put, pull off something. Um, and, what we found is you can't put a square peg in a round hole um, on your own. Mm. But that happens every time with Jesus. Yeah. Like Jesus can make that happen. We can't. And things that, that have happened, there is no logical explanation. It's just a miracle. Yeah. It's just God showing his power behind yeah. the project. And, and I mean that from every level because it was the moment of, and I want to give you two specific uh, examples. I don't really share these examples because um, I'm not usually in the front of the camera, but we, we got a moment where I'm a very prudent person in the sense of, hey, we need to not overspend. This, this money is intended for the show. You know, we can't just, you know, put it on anything that we want just because we have some money coming in. We need to be very, um, you know, uh, thoughtful of where this goes because we don't know if we're going to get more of it. Yeah. Yeah. And we got to the point where, uh, we did the first initial raise and a lot of money that was, um, promised didn't come through. Mm. Um, and we didn't have enough money to, to do the show. And so the whole reason why we'd shot four episodes is because we didn't have enough money to shoot eight <laughs> Wow. and we get shooting, uh, the four episodes and we got to a, a place where, um, we we needed enough money and it was it was a it was um a dollar amount it was like one hundred and twenty eight thousand dollars that we needed um or we couldn't move forward because my thing is if we don't have the money we're not moving forward um we we want to make sure that we can complete with something because it's going to cost us far more if we don't have the money than if we do um and i called up my wife and i says hey we're one hundred and twenty thousand plus dollars short you mind if we pull it out of our account to do it? And she says, we have been literally putting money into this project and, and all the time. And she goes, I will put every dollar that we have because I believe in it, but realize that you have partners. Like you, you've been the only one that's been putting money in and nobody else really has. And you need to realize that as well. And I says, well, we're at a place. We have the means. God gave it to us. It's not ours. It's his. Wow. We need to go there. Wow. And I <laughs> Sorry, I always have a tender heart. <laughs> <laughs> love but it. Love I remember it. like pleading to God because that's my only way chaos gives me peace is when I'm able to commune. And I have a, a daily devotional that I go through. And, and, and that was that conversation that night. And I, I went through my routine of, of prayer and scripture study and meditation and um, goal setting. And I got to the place where in my days, like I try to plan out my day. And I got to the place of, what are we going to do with that money? Am I going to pull it out of the account? And all I felt in my heart, it wasn't an audible voice, but you know how it, you can just feel it. Mm -hmm. It was just like, it's not yours to carry. Wow. And I, I went and left and I said, I don't even know what that means. And um, I get a phone call from Patrick, who's the CFO of Angel Studios. He says, oh, we just found $128,000 exact number that we need wow. and mm. we were able to, to do the show and it was wow. like hey it was there god knew it was there wow 
I I was ready to give it all, you know, to make it happen. Yeah. And it wasn't mine to, to, to wasn't bear. To yeah. But what was wow. beautiful about that was um, that 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 initial um, project was getting the full the full season done. Yeah. And it felt like we had something so amazing, but nobody would watch it. And and that was the struggle next. But the I think there's just beautiful moments where we get to the edge of the Red Sea and here comes Egypt and their armies ready to to devour us, you know, and we just have to submit and realize, oh no, wait. <laughs> oh, now you're humble? Okay, we'll 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 we'll, we'll part the Red Sea yeah, for you. Yeah. Right. And I think we had those Red Sea moments, and that's something that Dallas's wife has helped us understand is we, we always come to that edge of the Red Sea, but it's not us. Like, we can't cross it, you know? Wow. And and so that's kind of where we've been. And there's just been journeys like that along the way. And it's stuff that we've never talked about publicly. Mm-hmm. Um, we probably should because I think that would help people uh, understand more about the dynamics. But we just don't want to air all those frustrations. We want to be, we yeah. want to be positive. Yeah. Yeah. But it's it has been the most frustrating, difficult project I've ever worked on in my life. I've worked wow. on some of the biggest projects wow. in the world. And it's just like, man, I... I can't even handle the, the amount of stress. But then the moment that I realize, oh, it's not us, <laughs> it's God. God always provides every yeah. single time, yeah. every single time. We yeah. just got to get out of get out of the way. Brad, you mentioned that you had watched our, our podcast um, about, I'm sorry, Daryl. You had mentioned <laughs> uh, watching our podcast on our marital journey. And, uh, you know, we know a little bit about brokenness through this year. And I think every time I hear Dallas talking about the failure of the resurrection of what Gavin Stone, Gavin Stone, and how that brought him to a place of complete and utter failure as a professional filmmaker, thinking that that was his big chance and, and just, it, it, it implodes, but his wife, and then that secondary message comes Remember, all you can do is bring your five pieces of bread and your two pieces of fish. Exactly. Give it to God and let him do what only he can do with that. Exactly. And you've just illustrated that in numerous examples that you're still, Dallas, you, all the chosen folks are saying, we don't got much, but we'll give it all. Yep. And we'll watch you do what only you can do. Because I don't think that the movement that is now called the chosen movement, not just the chosen TV series, uh, could be could be where it's at. I don't think any observer could say this is just really good marketing and really good human uh, production and really good direction. And, you know, there, there is a very special anointing over what you guys are involved with. And, and it, it is having an impact and an influence and a power in our lives. I mean, certain episodes, uh, you, you hear that with people saying, well, my favorite episode, you know, and there's this community of conversation. We have heard some of our Latter-day Saint friends talk about, how the chosen Jesus, you know, just to put it in, a, in a, an explanation way, has, has revolutionized their view of Jesus, their understanding of what it means to have a relationship. And it's been so expanding into their theology and vice versa, the evangelical community. I think this whole narrative style, but, uh, but I just wanted to echo that it is through that brokenness and that humility that God shows up. It's when Gideon's army is brought down to 300. Oh, yeah. That we can, that God says, hey, the sword of the Lord and I can, Gideon. I, love I, that. It's I like can move favorite. now. You know, yeah. we, <laughs> we got rid of about 31,000 people. So uh, let's see what uh, what it looks like. So, Brad, you, you also have a story that brings, going back to Jill's original question about the relationships before. And I, I know we talked about the your music uh, love uh, uh, for uh, Christian, you know, contemporary Christian music and your role with both of the Christmas programs. So can, can you kind of talk about what your life looked like? prior to The Chosen and, and, and how that's really expanded uh, through through The Chosen experience? Sure. Um, as a 19-year-old boy, I served a mission for my church, like many, and I was called to serve in Michigan, and it was there knocking on doors that I learned I wasn't a Christian. <laughs> and uh, I was serving in Grand Rapids, home of Zondervan Publishing. Sure, sure. And I was, uh, people would anonymously drop at our apartment door, anti-Mormon literature. And, and so my perspective of evangelicals and traditional Christianity in general was very compatible because that's how they were approaching yeah, me. Yeah, yeah. And, um, and it's unfortunate that that's really how I left my mission uh, with a bit of an us and them attitude. Um, fast forward, we're living in Ohio and I'm building a home. And I have time on my hands, so I'm doing as much of it as possible. But I have a general contractor who's agreed to help me and work beside me. And he's an evangelical. 
And we work day after day after day, side by side, swinging hammers and working mm -hmm. together. And I, I came to love Steve. And uh, we couldn't help but talk about our fades. That's what he did, much more abundantly than I did. And, and it was a beautiful thing. I had traveled out of town, um, actually back to see my parents in Utah. And I received an early morning call from my wife. She said, I'm headed to the hospital. I think we've lost our baby. Oh. We were eight months along in a pregnancy. And I ran to the airport. By the time I got back to Ohio, that baby had been stillborn. Mm. And I, I come to the hospital. And who's there? but Steve, wow. my evangelical friend. And, uh, and what was he doing? He was praying with my wife. Yeah. Um, it was such a beautiful thing. And all of a sudden I realized he is my brother. He is my religious brother. He's my faith brother. We share a common faith in Jesus. I, I love his humility about his willingness to pray so openly and spontaneously. Prayers for me had been traditionally either silent in public or, you know, that morning prayer at the bedside. And here I was seeing him pray, and he prayed at work when we were swinging right, hammers. Right, right. And I just loved that about him. Now fast forward another decade. I'm raising 12 children, <laughs> and my teenagers are listening to music we don't want them to listen to. And uh, my two daughters are very musical, and they discover Christian music. And uh, half the family's been raised, and we're down to the middle, and, and we're like, what is this? And, and they had discovered this radio station on the dial called K-Love, and we had never heard of it. And they started listening to the music, and they said, Dad, let's go to a concert. Well, guess what? Christian bands don't stop in Utah very often. <laughs> That's changing, but you're right. You're very right. <laughs> but we couldn't find a concert to go to. And so we learned that every Labor Day or Memorial Day weekend in Nashville, K-Love hosts a big fan awards. And we saw all these artists are going to be performing at the fan awards. So I surprised my daughters and bought them tickets and we flew out to Nashville. And we thought, you know, well, we better be in our trench coats, you know, <laughs> we're entering evangelical territory. And, uh, and, and we entered the Grand Old Opry House and, and we really did feel just a little sheepish because we had never been in this environment. We'd never been to a Christian concert and they're on their feet and they're raising their hands and then why are they putting the words up on the screen? Why is everybody singing? You know, <laughs> and, and we watched this and before we knew it, we were just fully into it. We knew the music. We loved the music. We went to the fan awards, uh, fan awards every year thereafter, wow. um, including this last year where Dallas and I went together. So now uh, last August, September, uh, this would have been 2020 midst of COVID, I'm, I'm sitting at the kitchen table with Dallas and we're talking about the production schedule for season two. We have the set and, um, and now it's my responsibility of, as chief distribution officer to figure out how to keep fans engaged because it'll have been 18 months from the time season one came out till season two. And I said to him, I love your Christian music what if we put together a, Christ, a Christmas special of some sort and invited some of these musicians together and have them come to the set and I'll film at night and on weekends, you film the show during the day. And, uh, and he was frankly in a little disbelief that I'd even put that on the table. He actually questioned me, what are your favorite bands? You know, he wasn't so he's, sure. he's very sensitive when it comes to music. <laughs> But he finally said, I don't think you can pull it off, but if you can, go right ahead. And wow. so in parallel with his work, I began the work of finding contacts to these Christian bands, inviting them to come out to the set, just a multitude of miracles to make that happen. And uh, I remember the day that he and Amanda came to the set to film their introduction to the show for the broadcast. And... Um, and he was witnessing the performances and the crew I'd brought together and everything. And he came over to me and it was really, as Daryl knows, Dallas doesn't dish out many compliments. Uh, he's, a, he's a driver. And, and he came over to me and he said, okay, you, you did it. He says, that means a lot to me. 
that you'd work alongside me to help make this happen. And, uh, and of course, it was a beautiful thing when we were done. We were so proud, all of us, yeah. of what that became. And, and then now in the second year, we, oh we tried to make it bigger and better. And, and with COVID, we thought, wouldn't it be beautiful if people could gather in theaters to share yeah. this experience? And it broke every record in the record books. Um, but, but I would hope, speaking into your audience, yeah. that um, to the broader Christian community, you will see my heart and our heart about coming together. You know, Dallas had some opinions about how things would be done, but Daryl and I produced that. That represents our sort of offering of let's let's come together. Did you? Most people probably don't realize there are a couple Latter Day Saint artists in those performers. You know, and they're some of the most beloved. But guess what? To my Latter Day Saint friends who already know those artists, they're like, you know, who is this Brandon Lake character? <laughs> He's you know? so good, though. He is so good. <laughs> you know? So I love the fact that our communities are coming together with, uh, with our celebration and our worship and our faith. Both of you are talking about just the power of authentic relationship. It just is amazing. And what's what I'm fascinated by is that's what The Chosen is showing, too. It's showing right. the power of these very authentic relationships. It's amazing. Yeah really amazing yeah you know you, you you mentioned your experience as a missionary in grand rapids uh early on we one of one of the components of the the ministry that jill and i lead um is that we bring university students from california and alabama and across the country into utah for spring break instead of going down to some beach and you know being wild and crazy they come to utah to build relationships with latter-day saint students so they go to the institutes of religion they go to byu and we facilitate a whole week um we've been doing it for almost 20 years and a, a general authority of the church will actually come and vi visit with our students and engage them in Q and A. And all of this conversation has been going on uh, for, for this period of time. And it is about this authentic relationship uh, where as you, as you get to know somebody, as you get to understand what makes them tick, how they think, why they come up with what they do. Um, we have felt over and over that the evangelical students who who, you know, can say certain things like, you know, I believe this or I believe that, and, and it's not tested, it's not challenged, and it's just common vocabulary. But when somebody looks at you and honestly says, well, can you explain that to me? How do you believe that God is three in one and one in three? What does this Trinity thing mean? Because it's so foreign to me, and it's not asked to to, to kind of get you or to kind of uh, paint you into a corner, but it's, but it's asked honest. honest. Yeah. Then that evangelical student has come multiple times, and I've had Latter-day Saint students say the same. This has done more to help me understand my faith because I've just had to examine it in the light of openness with somebody who honestly doesn't see it the way I do, but it's not mad at me, not trying to get me, not attacking me, but just honestly saying, I don't see that. Can you help me understand that? And through that conversation, through that relationship, you walk away, even with that holy envy, even with the ability to say, you haven't convinced me. I'm not, I'm not able to go where you're at, but... I can totally appreciate the journey that you're on or how you've come to that or why you believe that, or at least to understand you know, what you mean by that. And I think, again, to, to the rabbi's uh, prayer for you guys in Israel, let's gather. What could be more powerful than gathering together, talking about Jesus, understanding his story, understanding the ripples that come from those initial gospel presentations, gospel events, and what it could mean in 2022 and the time that we live in. And it's, it's still the most powerful message in the, in the universe, you know, that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. And if we would believe in him, we'd have eternal life. Wow. Um, I love it. I love it, Jill. I think yeah. what you're tapping into is excellent. The, I think the mission is, is kind of coming out in all of your stories of, of what you're doing, but I'd love to hear from you, maybe Daryl, to talk about like what is the mission and, and are there challenges that, that come with, with bringing that about? Yeah, I love that. Love that question. So I think um, there's several missions. I, I don't want to say there's just one mission for that. Um, my <coughs> heart has always um, been pulled in a direction, um, and it's to, to the rising generation, to Gen Z. Like I, mm -hmm. I've built a career building audiences around them. And I believe they, they're an amazing generation that just need to know who they are, 
and get behind something good. Yeah, yeah. And they know they will know what to do next. They they will be the most natural gatherers that the earth has ever seen. And um, they just need to be shown. And so there's a lot of confusion and there's a lot yep, of yep. misinformation out there and a lot of, of hesitation because of their, their parents and their grandparents and some of their strictness of, oh, no, this is the way it is. And they're not trying to be authentic or true. They're just trying to protect the kids. And they don't want that. They want, they want authenticity. So like from day one, um, I was impacted by the shepherd and I showed it to my family and I have five, five kids and um, my wife loved it and the kids enjoyed it. I, I won't say they were really, really impacted by it, but they enjoyed it and they thought, okay, that's, that's a great Christmas little reminder. Um, but the whole essence of the show was there's certain tones and dialogue that could happen in a in in an eight episode season that you can't have in a movie and that's what i was the most interested in and so from day one i says dallas i just want to make sure that this content will engage that rising generation and my heart has always been with them and i i I believe that this could be the catalyst to help them know and love jesus and what he taught and they'll know what to do after that. We won't even need to even get in the way. They'll just they'll just go do it on their own. And um, so that's kind of been my my uh, intentions. And I want to tell you it more uh, personally, is because I got five kids. I see the world that they're living in. I see the content that they're exposed to. I see the high school that they go to and what they're exposed to there. And we're we're in you know small <laughs> town Utah. Yeah, but it's still not conducive to God's spirit. You know, there's a lot of the worldliness in Babylon that's all in that. And so, um, you know, seeing the shows, I wanted the show to impact them to the same level that it impacted me, you know, and I, I believe that it could. And I read the scripts for the, the, the first season. And I'm like, only if we can actually get it to pull off as good as in my head. And it got pulled off even better. Because I didn't have sound design and music in my head. I just had visuals, right? <laughs> and it just like everything came together. And, and I, I would say um, I'm, I'm a, uh, a dad that I don't like to say, hey, you're going to go do this. I want it to be their own uh, desire and thought. I, I think the more that I try to push my will onto them, they'll, they'll rebel. And so it's just setting up solid principles for them. And so one of the things is, um, I tried to binge watch the show with my family and, and I had uh, one of my 15 year old, he's, he's uh, now 18, but he was falling asleep first episode every time. And I'm like, come on, this is a show I put a lot of energy and money into. Like the least you could do is stay awake, but he just falls asleep. And it hurt, it hurt me because I knew that he needed it. He didn't have a personal relationship with Jesus. Um, he didn't know the Jesus that I did. I mean, we try to teach, we try to preach, we try to, you know, give them those opportunities. We, I, I'm a big believer in creating opportunities for them to discover Jesus. Um, and, and so it's hurt. And so, you know, we get through um, the, at least almost a year. And I'm just like, oh, I just don't, I don't know if I'm gonna have this kids ever going to watch the, the show, you know, and here I am putting effort. And I know this will help him have a better relationship because I, I I believe in the content and I believe in his generation and I know how they think. Um, and, and I know that this is all he need because it's so, it's so authentic and it's so playful that it, it just, it's like a magnet to this generation. And so anyway, um, his older brother says, um, Hey, how you feeling? I'm like, well, I just, th- this is how I feel. And you know me, I don't like to push any, anything. Um, and I won't bring it up, you know, I'll just create an opportunity. We can binge watch again and hopefully he stays awake and he goes, yeah, okay, just go ahead and do that. I mean, that's the best approach. And, and, and we did it again. First episode, he was out cold and I'm like, okay, this is never going to work. <laughs> and, and so we, we binge watched it with some uh, friends of ours that was there. Uh, we talked about it for a little bit. I got up and, you know, it was about 11 o'clock at night and I was like, all right, let's just go to bed and, and so on. And, um, my son said, hey, my oldest son went to him and says, hey, you know, dad put a lot of energy and effort in. and You just fall asleep every time. Like, give it a shot. Just see what you like. He goes, I really think this is amazing. I think it's going to be impactful for you. And so out of, out of duty to his older brother, mm-hmm. not his dad, 
um, he, he got through the first episode. And he got to the second episode and he fell in love with Matthew. He loved uh, Matthew's journey. And uh, it, it, it kind of pulled him in. And yeah, I mean, <clears throat> the demon possessed woman, you know, you know, Mary and the transformation was good and it, it hit him, you know, but not to the level that the episode three, seeing Jesus interact with children, like that's never really been done before uh-huh. in the way that it is. I mean, he's blowing raspberries, like yeah. Jesus blowing raspberries, <laughs> you know, but he, he was there and interacted in a way and then he was hooked and I, I get, I'm an early riser, but he, he, he knocks on my door three in the morning and um, I open it up and I says, what's wrong? And he's just tears just oh running down his face. And he goes, dad, Jesus really does live, doesn't he? I says, yes, he does. Wow. <laughs> he goes, and he's a real person, right? Like, yes. He goes, I know he lives. I just know it. And right then and there, every oh inch God. that crawled on glass, every dollar that we put into the project was worth it. Absolutely. If that one person just could feel that and know Jesus, that was it. That was good enough for me. Yeah. But it was the next day, it was like, I want more of this generation to experience that. This can happen. It is happening. We're reading these stories, but now it's more personal to me. I'm seeing it in my own home. And this authentic Jesus needs to go out to more people. We want to get it out to a billion people. And so we, like, I, I'm telling you, like, I, I'm so focused in on that mission of getting out to a billion people to see an authentic Jesus. Powerful. But the generation that I want it to hit is that generation. Yeah. And I want it to do another thing. I want the other generations, you know, the boomers down um, to, to have a little bit more compassion and understanding of this rising generation because they're misunderstood. Yeah. They are literally misunderstood, and we try to put the same type of tactics that was used upon us on them, and it just doesn't work. What we need to do is realize and learn from Jesus' ministry mm-hmm. of how he approached people. Yeah. And what I love, and this, this is why I love the show, is the controversial moment of Jesus preparing for the Sermon on the Mount, how he prepared. Mm-hmm. Okay. Mm-hmm. Was it plausible? Would it happen? We don't know. Yeah. Right. We don't right. know. Yeah. We don't know. Yeah. But I love, I love <clears throat> the attitudes. Oh my goodness. That right there told me why he called each individual disciple. Yeah. And what was going in my heart when I read that and when I saw it, it was like, he's calling us. Yeah. Same and way. we're all from diverse backgrounds and problems and we're all flawed. Yeah. But yet, He's the only one that can know exactly what he needs from us and what we can become if we will just surrender. Yeah. And I'm, I'm telling you, like, I don't care what faith background you come from. You could be agnostic or, you know, Messianic Jew yes, or Catholic yes, yes. or LDS or evangelical, traditional, Pentecostal. It doesn't Whatever. matter. It's just listening to how he taught, what he taught. And then the more important thing is not just watching the show. The show is just a TV show. What it leads to is a deeper relationship with God, a deeper relationship to scripture of understanding God's will and his path. That's all I care about. Like, seriously, at the end of the day, the chosen will come and go. But if it will inspire people to actually develop a relationship, an honest, transparent, authentic relationship with God and Jesus, that's what it's all about. And the powerful moment for me in that and just listening to the sermon with the Beatitudes was just to realize that we spend so much time trying to look successful or trying to to look like we have it all together. And that's what I love about that generation is just to say, like, they, they, they call it out. You know, my teenagers call it out when I try to say, put put everything in a pretty little box and, and make it look a certain way. They're like, no, I, I don't think that's the way it is. And I love with the Beatitudes and, and even just hearing it on the chosen in such a, a rich, authentic way is it, it reminds me that I am made in God's image and that I am a broken person. And it's really my weakness that, that makes God strong in me. And I love that. And I think even just in, in the mm-hmm. stuff that Greg and I have gone through in our marriage, 
and um, and you were just reflecting on how authentic we were able to share that. And yeah. I think, you know, God brought bro- both of us to a very broken place and then being able to share our stories. And I can't tell you how many times people have opened up to us and, because we've been able to be open and real and raw about who we are. And, and it really brings out um, the God stories that both of you are talking about to to see that God really is strong in our weakness and our brokenness. And, and I wish we could just throw out all the ideas of, of what in America it means to be successful yeah. and really just walk authentically with Jesus. Yeah, and I, what I love about the show and I love about Jesus's life, I mean, that's, that's what it's all about is his, his, his life and his ministry and what he taught. Um, like what he taught is by far the way of transformation. Like we just need to internalize it. We need to understand it. We need to develop that stronger relationship. But knowing that who he called and the diversity of who he called and the age too, they were young. They yeah. were young comparatively yeah, yeah, to, yeah. to the, the people of the time. And so imagine here's, here's Jesus's disciples going out and preaching and they're, they're trying to, to teach rabbis and people that, you know, Pharisees, Pharisees that <laughs> lived their whole life <laughs> thinking that they were all that. Yeah, and, yeah. And, and to come to learn that God knows God knows us and he, God knows what he needs. And what I love is, and this is by far, I believe the most powerful moment for me in the Bible um, is the essence of why. Um, why did he choose to reveal himself as the Messiah to a Samaritan yeah. who's the enemy of the Jew right, and then to a woman who is not the same class of citizen in that time no. and in that area as a man, but not only that, an outcast in society that he was the Messiah. Why, why would he do that? And then why would he start his ministry? Well, first off, being alone with a woman, that was breaking Jewish yeah, law. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> you know, he sent his yeah, disciples in, yeah, yeah. broke laws of all Jewish law, right? And then it was the moment that he publicly started his ministry he went into the land of the enemy. Mm -hmm. Why? And I look at it this, and I love the stories that are intertwined of Mm -hmm. what could be plausible in The Chosen. It was because the intentions of what the Jews thought the Messiah was going to do was not really the intentions of what the Messiah Mm -hmm. is going to do. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, and and, and that that right there was he came for all. He came for the heart. And I think that the Mm -hmm. essence of the project and and anyone that's listening to this podcast or watching this podcast, the fastest way to grow a bridge is get to the heart because the heart will not deceive. Right. You know, and and you can feel it. You can understand it. And yes, there's there's people out there. There's charlatans out there trying to deceive, but they're always trying to find fault with people to. And I believe that's thwarting the work in so many different ways. Like our job is to gather and that. That the job of, of Jesus is to sort it out later because that's that's what he said it was. Yeah, I mean it was it was Jesus who said, "If you'll lift up my name, I, I'll do the drawing." Exactly, I'll do the compelling. When when the early Corinthians were struggling with Paul about, "Hey, I'm a Paul guy or I'm a I'm a uh, Apollos guy or whatever," yeah, yeah. Paul says, "Hey, uh, we're all of Jesus, you know." At the end of the day. We plant, we water, but the Holy Spirit, he's the one that gives the increase. So let's not take any credit. Let's not try to say it's our way or our personality or our church or our religion or whatever. It is the power of God working through a broken human vessel that, and I think, you know, we we were talking about some of our favorite uh, chosen scene moments. And by the way, you can see that we're all wearing our chosen (laughs) gear, our favorite shirts. You got trouble coming over from here with Jill and we're kind of into the get used to different line and binge Jesus. So uh, get onto the uh, chosen dot TV website and check out some of that gear for yourself by all means. Um, But the dichotomy between Mary coming back after a time of, of, going back to, to a, an old life. And again, this is not biblical theology. This is not, but it's it's a narrative that certainly is plausible and speaks to the possibility of, of how Jesus would handle a situation like that where, where she comes back and could, her- Could we, yep. just one quick yep, thing. Yep. This is really important. Okay. Um, there's one little detail in that that most <clears throat> people don't really see. And um, it's something knowing people and situations and problems and baggage is PTSD. 
Okay. Like we're starting to discover yeah. that a lot more yeah. now. Yeah. Um, it was the moment that she was gathering yes. and saw that Roman guard. Yes. And it was like that flashback of yeah. her past that Absolutely. triggers. Absolutely. And and that sets us on uh, human emotion. Yeah. That leads us on a path. And mm. and, and and the more that we're on human emotion, <clears throat> um, that that leads away that path leads away from having faith. It's just like we're more about all the stuff that happened to us and it cool. kind of compounds. And that's why it's so very plausible. And when you hear the backstory of the lead writer having a background in alcoholism exactly. and knowing what it was like to fall back into that and come back out of it again. So that when any human being would watch that scene and say, you know, I don't know, you know, what it is that everybody else deals with, but my trigger or my thing that, that I would might go back to as a security or as a, as a feeling uh, that, that I once was attracted to or addicted to or whatever could certainly well up inside and, and tempt us to come back. And when she does come back after, you know, Peter and Matthew retrieve her and find her and, and compel her to come home, uh, come back to, 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 to Jesus, um, his line to her is, I never asked anything of you. I just wanted your heart. Right. And here she was saying it like, I failed you. I, right. I've disappointed you. And Jesus says, no, no. You see, I never asked of you to do anything. Yeah. And I think that is as biblical to any, you know, the, the theology there is 1,000% biblical, that we can never do enough to impress God. We can never get our stuff together. Uh, in the past or in the present or in the future, you know, Paul himself says, the very things I don't want to do in Romans 7, I find myself doing them. The things I want to do, I don't do. Who is going to set me free from this, this tendency, this body of death, he calls it? And then the next line is, thanks be to God yeah. through Jesus Christ. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ. That, and that's, that's amazing. I just love it because that, that really speaks to the essence, um, I believe, of bridge building, which is knowing the heart. God wants the heart. And Bingo. you can have the heart with different faith backgrounds. I do do believe that. And it will be sorted out later. It really and, will. And, and, it yet, will. and yet Jesus' same compelling effort to reach Nicodemus, which, again, is a, a topic that theologians have always debated. You know, where is Nicodemus on the spectrum of saved or not saved? And, and what's happened to him by the end of Jesus' life and death and resurrection when he retrieves the body and, and works out for the, uh, the, the burial. Mm -hmm. um, there's something going on in Nicodemus. And this backstory that, again, is just part of the narrative. And we're not saying that these details are, are in the scripture. But when, when Nicodemus is behind the wall and is weeping, like you can just sense he's that close, but something is holding him back. He, yeah. He's not going to let go of what he's got to give, to get Jesus. He has, he's not there yet. At that moment, he's willing to emotionally say that he's a follower, yeah. but not take that first step. No, and you yet, know? and and the brilliance of that moment is that you don't think of Nicodemus as, oh, what a terrible guy. How you know, you go, I get it. I get how hard that would be for him, and and how hard it would be for it is hard for someone to step into faith when maybe it costs them a relationship or parents or you know, Bob Millet and I. If, you, if he were here right now, he would say this. The most powerful moments in our years of doing public presentations, which we called, uh, back then we could use the word Mormon, a Mormon and an evangelical he conversation. Now. <laughs> <laughs> but we used it's to make the these. the Mormons. We gave, we gave over 60 presentations uh, all around the country. And we would have somebody come up to us and say, you know, my, my son left our faith and became a Latter-day Saint. And, and, and we haven't talked to him in years. Because of tonight, we're going to call him tomorrow. Or, you know, I, I, uh, I lost a, a parent or somebody to an evangelical faith. And as a Latter-day Saint, it's just divided me from them. And, and we're going we're gonna to go back and we're going to try to rebuild that relationship. Because, you know, in the spirit of, of wanting to pursue what you feel compelled to pursue and, and, and what you perceive to be truth as, as each person takes that journey in life, um, it does affect and complicate other relationships sometimes. It does. But, but what would God have us do? Turn away from one another, separate, divide, hate, uh, disdain. Uh, I, I, I mentioned earlier, you know, with your Michigan uh, missionary experience, up in northern, I'm, I kind of forgot this point, up in northern Ogden, we had a bishop who was asked by his state president to host a student group. And he, he literally asked his state president, he said, please don't make me do this. I serve my mission in North Carolina. I was beaten up for two years by these people. I do not care for them. I do not like them. And the state president said, no, you got to. <laughs> so this guy, 
is hosting a group of about 30 Biola University students in his ward uh, with his single students. Uh, he, had a, he was a single ward uh, bishop. And you could just tell at the beginning, he was so uncomfortable. And he came over to me at the end of that evening. And with tears streaming down his face, he said, thank you. I said, why? What? 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 What is your response about? He said, I have spent the last 20 years hating evangelicals because of the way I was treated. Tonight, you've let me see that these students love Jesus and they're not my enemy. And I am a changed man. And I was like, that's why we do this. This is awesome. You know, so um, I don't know if you have some some uh, background too to, to this, you know, to the um, uh, question of, of the mission or, or, or the challenges to accomplish that mission. It seems like, you know, you have a pretty strategic role in, in advancing this cause. So uh, uh, if you wanted to comment, I want to yeah, make sure I'll you just, have a chance. I'll just share a recent example. So as part of my duties at The Chosen, I take on special projects. And one of the projects that we recently took on was to expose a group of young people to The Chosen, people that had never seen it before. Oh, okay that didn't necessarily have a practicing faith. And uh, we recruited them from across the US. We flew them to Utah. We just told them they were gonna binge a TV show and we wanted their reaction to it. So they had no idea they were gonna see a Jesus show. And they were all seated on couches and we brought up the trailer <laughs> and uh, the lights were up just enough so we can catch their reactions. And you can imagine, you know, it was like, what? did I sign myself up for? Wow. And they sat and watched the whole first season of The Chosen. Oh my goodness. Nine kids in their early 20s. And um, I walked in at the end of the day and sat there with them. We turned the cameras off and, and I just thanked them for what I witnessed. Yeah. Uh, I was witness to God working in their lives through simply the medium of television to introduce them to the fact that if they had a Christian faith growing up, maybe they didn't ever have a relationship with Jesus, or maybe they didn't think Jesus was an approachable Jesus, someone that they could love and he could love them and accept them. Some of them were atheists, but they saw in that depiction somebody that they wanted to get to know. It posed some questions. This man thought he was God? What if he was? And we've followed those kids for months now. Oh, wow. We've flown to their communities. We've interviewed them. We actually invited them back a month later and took them to the Goshen Sep and walked around and then asked them to share stories about what's happened in their lives since then. Wow. And it's a beautiful thing. And we're going to share this with our audience oh, in the new year. Yeah. Um, but I... I've witnessed in these recent months the impact of simply just putting before someone uh, what we call an authentic Jesus. Now, mm. we're not saying that factually. We're just saying, here's a Jesus who came as God in flesh, but he came in flesh. He was a man. He danced. He blew raspberries. <laughs> he laughed. He had friends. They were pretty misfit, right? Mm. And he loved them, and he invited them into a life that was unlike anything they had imagined. And that's what he's inviting us into, a life like anything we can't imagine. For Nicodemus, he thought he was going to be giving up way too much. Yeah. He was yeah. holding on tight, yeah. right? Yeah. I've done that. I know what sure, that's like. Sure. I want to be in charge. <clears throat> but guess what? Once I let go, once I opened my hands... My life was different, and what I received was so much richer than what I was holding on to. Yeah. And that's what he invites us into. So the mission of the chosen is not to be scripture. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's not to pretend that we know exactly what Jesus was like or what his friends were like. It's simply to present him in the language, really, of a modern generation. Yeah. We don't read a lot anyway, yeah, yeah, but if yeah. we can show you a story... Right that draws you to scripture, maybe you'd love to read. I know for me, I see these stories depicted. I see the scripts early, but boy, when I see them come to life, man, I want to dig into those stories. I want to get to know 
those characters. But are different. you like me when you start reading Matthew? You hear Matthew's voice. Oh yeah, you're just like, what's going yeah. on here? There are some things that are ruined. Out. It's all ruined. I don't, I don't know don't. how that happens, but it does every single time. Yeah. Uh, what's so powerful about this for me is just. You know, we've spent a lot of years as evangelicals trying to strategize and figure out, like, how can we reach the world for Christ, you know? And we have these conversations about how to do that. And it seems like with The Chosen, God laid the groundwork with some authentic relationships and and just did it himself, brought together people of all different giftings. Cause I, I mean, it's powerful. It's nothing that... I feel like any person could come up and say, let's let's do this thing. It sounds like even Dallas didn't even know, you know, the impact that it would have and and the fact that it's reaching all different faiths. The, so the, powerful. There's moments of um, clarity in the sense of, you know, we, we always um, project and like, okay, we, you know, we'd like to do X, Y, or Z, you know, during this time and the impact that it has. Like we're really impact driven. Because mm-hmm. we believe that it's impact that people will share and then that will get more interest and so on and so forth. But it was the moment um, of where it accelerated just doesn't make any sense. We were at a point where um, internally I was going through the numbers and I'm like, uh, we're never going to have the, the money to raise um, uh, in time to do a production uh, for the season. At this rate, it will take us literally two and a half years to to even do that and it was the moment where it was like what if we gave it away for free what if what if we actually binge watched the show um that you know the pandemic's happening people are there what if we did that and it was it was a, a radical idea because it doesn't make any sense outside of exposure to do that uh we went to our distribution partner because they hold the rights to that <laughs> we just can't do it because we want to and, and they're like, hey, that sounds like a good idea. They're willing to, to test it. And then prior to that, we, we had a, the Pay It Forward program going where we had some mon- money trickle in quite a bit during Christmas, but then it just kind of slowed way down at the first of the year, which makes sense, right? And, and we got to that moment where, hey, we had a good idea. I, I was on the live stream because we, we live stream everything. I um, was looking at the numbers and looking at the people that we had on and I lost it. I, it, it just something super unexplained happened after the end of the live stream is that that dollar amount, uh, you know, we, we quadrupled the, the highest day that we ever had wow. that day. And then the next day it like quintupled. And I'm like, wow. And by the end of it, there was actually a path to actually fund the season and get it shot. It was a, a total miracle. It was like what we call impossible math. It was like, you cannot explain it. Yeah, yeah. You cannot explain it. And it was from an idea. And then it led to, I believe, I believe the indicator of what the chosen always needs to be, which is free for everyone. Because that's the moment we made it free. That was the moment that we made wow. it free. There was, no, there was no pay gate. There was no nothing from there. It was just a way that you can contribute to get it in front of more people. And I think that's what God wanted us to to, to know and understand like when we get out of his way and we, we can get it in every country and it's free and it's easy and it's accessible and it's easy to watch, which isn't necessarily the case right now, but we're still working on those things. Right. Mm-hmm. If it's that, that's the way then, then mountains will move. Miracles will happen. Yeah. You know, and I, that's, that's, that's those are the little <clears throat> stories that not a lot of people get to hear. We get, we talk about a little bit here or there, but it's like, there's just these very monumental moments that realize, man, it's not even us. It's just like, okay, it's just more, how do we align ourselves with God's will? Because right. we're not doing a very good job. We try to put that to happen. But as soon as we just say, okay, this is an idea and it, it's God's will. And then it's just like, oh, oh, we were supposed to do that all along. Oh, how about that? <laughs> well, again, it goes to <clears throat> what Paul said, you know, we plant, we water, we lift up his name and then God moves or it's the, it's the, five pieces of bread, two yep. fish, and we can feed 5,000 with that? Are you kidding me? Yeah. That's, that doesn't work. It doesn't work any way. And what I'm amazed by, I had the privilege for about six years to serve as the state coordinator for the Billy Graham Association in Utah. And they, we had a state coordinator in every state. And and the Franklin Graham uh, leadership, you know, with, with regards to reaching uh, Utah or uh, 
Massachusetts or whatever state was a combined effort. And we've had these outreaches and we've had these crusades and we've had these festivals. And, you know, that that's one of the gatekeeper organizations in the evangelical world, the BGA. It's one of the most well-known or the LDS Church General Authorities or the National Association of Evangelicals. I happen to serve on that board. And, and there's never been a U Utah clergyman that's been asked to serve on that board. So I think that's a really cool privilege to, to represent Utah, this small little evangelical community of Utah in a larger religious majority culture, um, precisely because I think the NAE sees this relationship between the Latter-day Saint community and leadership. And so when in 2011, we came and served, uh, we had a board meeting here, uh, Jeffrey Holland was asked and he received that invitation to come and speak to our entire board at the governor's mansion. So this, this kind of thing has been happening, but the chosen kind of seems to go past all of that institutional gatekeeper kind of authority and just emerges like out of nowhere. And Jill and I, again, have commented about, it's like, it's like where we're busy concocting and planning and strategizing and thinking, God says, I have an idea. Oh, well, well I'll just do why. it. <laughs> I mean, and you know why? I think this is the, the essence of the show is, and, and the whole uh, the whole reasoning behind it is because we're not a religion. Yeah. You know, it's it's about Beautiful. what he taught is what the story of the, the, the TV show is. We don't have to be cluttered with these um, history and the background and the, the problems and the issues and how things will be perceived. We just need to just do a very good job yeah. at telling the story. Yeah. And yeah. that's not my job. It's not Brad's job. That's Dallas's job. Yeah. You know, and that that's where he carries the weight. And I, with the writers, like they just do a brilliant job. Um, another thing, um, and this is really important for everyone to know and understand, but season three took a while to write. Um, and, and, you know, the weight is real. And, and this is what I love about Dallas. It doesn't financially make sense to extend out anything. But there would have never been a, a Christmas with the Chosen if we had the season uh, three scripts ready to go. Mm. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. But we had some major obstacles. Um, one was writer's block and some of the, the issues around the script and where it was going and, and making sure it was true. And it was in line. But the moment that it was in line on the script, um, everything just opened up. Like we, we like, okay, we just got a delay. And Brad's like, well, let's do another Christmas special. I'm like, all right, let's go for it. Let's do it in theaters. Okay, let's do this. And it was like, okay, it's all great. But the moment that we decided to do that, that's when the scripts came together. And it was just like, oh, we were meant to do this. Yeah, yeah. This, this Christmas. You see the chosen. divine hand yeah. over and over. We were meant to make the impact. And then two, being in theaters all around, you know, and letting it be seen now worldwide the impact that it has. And what I love about it, it's, it's worship. It's worship through song, through monologue. I love the monologues, oh by my the goodness. way. Oh my goodness. And, and then the, an episode that's raw, real, authentic. I think that's you know, yeah. seeing Joseph scoop poop. Yeah. Like that was, yeah. I'm like, I didn't even think about that. I thought, you know, pristine manger when I was growing up, but man. <laughs> I grew up on a farm. I knew it was far worse than that. <laughs> well, Jill and I were privilege, I think you know this, uh, we asked uh, Utah's Attorney General Sean Reyes and his wife Stacia to join us, and they came and watched the uh, the Christmas special with us on December 1st, night number one. And had we known that uh, yeah. that some of the performers were actually going to be in various locations, we might have changed our uh, didn't you say Jonathan was down in, in San He was in my theater. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know how that happened. <laughs> well, well, had we known... Thing I told well, yes. Night, like, we'll, we'll exchange contact information. <laughs> <laughs> we we would have chosen to go to a different theater, but I was talking to Greg, like, I think we would have been distracted by We would have never the had the conversation. And we had true, authentic relationship with Sean and Seisha, and it was good. And I, I think the beginning of a further friendship with them. So. <clears throat> and, and it's Sean, always good to have the attorney no, general in it your was. back pocket. You know? <laughs> <laughs> He's a friend. Uh, <clears throat> I serve on a, a board for him, but he, he, he has really been, been open to this, you know, relationship and friendship. And one of the things he said about the monologues, he said, you know, I enjoyed everything, Greg, but those four monologues. And for me, Jehovah Shalom that is read or, mm. or delivered by Simon Peter's wife, uh, her, the actress. Yeah. Oh, my Mara. goodness. We, we were so affected by that, uh, that particular, mon at least I was. We, uh, uh, we even had it shared at a recent Christmas pastor's luncheon that we hosted for pastors and we just kind of uh shared the monologue and and talked about it and you could just see the 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 impact of the of the pastors to that hadn't seen it and it was very very dramatic so i i know we are 
gosh, we could keep talking and talking and talking. We probably have to figure out a way to bring this to an end. I know that we have at least one. I, we're going to dish some other questions and just uh, do a part two some other day, uh, uh, maybe. But um, I know that that there is probably still a lot of questions out there on the part of, of different camps and, and certainly the, the overall um, structure of The Chosen. Um, I know that recently, I think as recently as December 17th, uh, Dallas posted again another kind of response to some of the criticism of 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 kind of putting uh, too much into the, the, the into the story and not all of it being right out of the bible you know and and some of the associations with other faith groups and the catholic influence or the latter-day saint influence um in particular um i'd love to see you guys address both those questions the 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 shared faith connection particularly among the lds both of you being senior leaders in the in the chosen leadership and how you've already told the story of how that kind of came to be, but how that's worked out and how that's how that's um, being accomplished so successfully. I think it, it really is all born out of the relationship that you've already shared. Uh, but I do think people are 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 tend they just tend to go back to what is their familiar place of, you know, but but the Latter-day Saints can't be involved in this. Uh, the Catholics can't be involved in this if they're the evangelicals and they and they kind of perceive Dallas as as a professing evangelical as our guy. So they're wondering what is he doing? And is he getting diluted? Is he getting impacted? Is he getting influenced? And and I and I just I personally understand based on what we said. Those are all the wrong questions. Those are all the wrong questions. It is about what we've been talking about. What the story is actually um, promoting and telling. But can we address those two questions of of whether or not the narrative of the narrative side of the chosen is somehow introducing uh, extra biblical material that is adding to or taking away from the Bible? which again, I think Dallas is very specifically addressed and also this influence in this relationship. Cause actually I think it is, it is the miracle of the chosen and not something to be uh, weary of, but to something to be very thankful for. So I wanted to give you guys a chance. To I, I don't mind. Those. I don't mind taking yeah. a, um, a response to that. So, you know, diverting from the Bible. Well, this is a TV show. This is not the Bible. Right. Uh, let's make that clear. Um, and, and I do believe the way that the writers approach it. So it's Dallas, Tyler and Ryan, is is very thoughtful of making sure what is in scripture is is accurate you know uh the the recorded um uh moments so let me let me give you one yeah uh, i think this is probably the perfect cadence from a prior question that you asked or we had a discussion on so in capernaum uh we know that peter lived in capernaum we know that he had a mother-in-law um, we know that andrew was there and james and john uh, we know that peter was a fisherman and he was in commerce. And if you're in any commerce, you're going to have to pay taxes. We know Matthew was there paying tax. Uh, they had to pay tax to Matthew. Um, what we don't know was how Peter felt uh, towards the tax man. Mm -hmm. And uh, someone that was his, his people that portrayed the Jews and go help the Romans. We right. just don't know how that, yeah. uh, how that dynamic, dynamic is. However, it's completely plausible uh, to think that Matthew felt like he was on an island alone. He felt like no one loved him from the Jew side and Romans hated him because he was a Jew. And he felt lonely. And the moment that Jesus came in and says, you know, Matthew, the son of Alphaeus, follow me. What did he do? He dropped everything and followed. Okay. That's what we do know. That's, what, that's what's documented in the Bible. Yeah, right? Yeah. It's the moments of seeing everything that led to it is where we have the creativity to establish why that was so impactful by someone just dropping everything that they have to follow Jesus might not give you context of, wait a minute, he was a Jew collecting taxes. You know, he was, uh, felt like he was, uh, um, on a, on a little island that nobody understood him because the way that he maybe thought or hated. whatever hated it. Yeah. I right? mean, he was hated. Yeah. 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 Oh, and he, he was probably oblivious to a lot of this stuff, but yes. But I think that's the, the plausible moments. And so the show, it builds up the backstory that we, where Dallas and the writers take the creativity and then establish what could have been plausible for that moment to be recorded in the Holy Scriptures and in the Gospels. And why was it, why was it, why was it uh, written? You know, and it's not trying to say, oh, we could we could make the sermon better or whatever. No, the sermon is the sermon. The elements 
uh, are all creative coming up to it, but the sermon is the sermon. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. and so uh, from that that side, um, Dallas and the writers, that's where they take the most charge on. And it is a fine line. And, and that's why we have biblical cons consultants, we have historical consultants, um, we have uh, people, uh, you know, a Messianic Jew, Rabbi Jason, uh, we have uh, Father Guffey, and yeah. then we, we, we have others that, that um, uh, Dr. Huffman and, and a few others that help advise, hey, nah, this is kind of there, whatever. Um, and so they just want to make sure that it, it, it does have balance, but it's not a replacement for the Bible. The Bible is the Bible. Uh, this, this is a TV show, but it's a TV show about the uh, plausible situations of, of humans yeah. and how they interact with people and what happens to them when they are redeemed. Yeah. And, and I think the whole essence, I um, um, wasn't going to share this one. This is a good one, though. Uh, when I first read the first script of season one, I go, Dallas, this is dark. <laughs> He can't start this show off this dark. And he goes, no, Daryl, you have to understand. This is the show. It's about transformation. Yeah. It's about we're all flawed and discovering. We can be changed. And the only thing that's, that, that's different in between is it's him. Yeah. He was, that, that's, that's the yeah. whole show. That's yeah. the whole yeah. seven seasons that we're going to do. We have to establish it now. I go, Jesus is only in this. And like, not even... Two pages. It's like a half a page. It's like, yep, it'll work. It'll work. Um, but it did, and it, it it was received, and it was like, oh, this is different. And I think that set the tone of what the show is. And so that that answers that question. Well said. I think, well said. Um, around uh, who God is calling to to help the chosen. Yeah. Um, this I've seen this from day one. Is we will have specific needs. And um, we, it will be apparent to us, oh, we're deficient here or we need that. And God provides. It's like someone felt led, says, oh, I felt led to do X, Y, Z. Brad felt led uh, to help us with his gifts that God's given him and his connections and his life experience. But two, uh, along the way, it's like we literally have been gathering the team members that have felt led to be a part of the project. And what's beautiful is in, in my uh, chief of staff, we have a uh, <laughs> lover to death. I do. Her name's Julie. And she's probably one of the most underappreciated person in the world that works on The Chosen because she has to deal with me and Dallas. I don't know how anyone can do that because we're both. It's on, hard. It is like literally on both extremes, right? But she's the glue that keeps us rolling and, and things happening um, just the way that our structure is. She had a really, really nice job at, a, at, a, at uh, Ernest & Young. It was like a really, like a very, very high management position. that they, She got paid a lot of money. She felt led to be a part of the, the chosen fan club. And she would put in two or three hours a night leaving comments about how much she loved the show. Oh, my goodness. And I, I, Dallas showed me one. I'm like, man, this is good, you know? This is really good. And she said, oh, we should probably get her for a moderator. So I call her up. I says, hey, have you ever thought about just helping us, you know, doing this? Said, yeah, I'll, I'll do it. And so here she was volunteering 10 hours a week, yeah. just contributing her loaves and fishes. She was way more qualified in so many different things. And then uh, I, I felt, hey, let's just, let's just hire her. And so she was balancing two jobs. She's working part-time for us and full-time for Ernst & Young. And it was it's like this, uh, you know, um, need came up where we needed someone to help manage us. Yeah. We don't we don't know anybody, so we put it out there. We started to apply, and it was like, hey, have you talked to Julie? Like Julie would actually work really well with this. And I'm like, well, yeah, I mean, I talked to her, and she's making a lot of money. I don't know if she would give up that to come work for us, you know, full time. And so we had the conversation. And she's like, yeah, no, I, I'm, I'm all in. <laughs> like, oh, wow. like all, all in. Yeah. And she left a very, I mean, her education and everything in a certain aspect of, of work and business to come in and, and, and herd cats. Because that's what it is <laughs> with me in Dallas. It's like herding cats. But, but it's, she's helped furthering the work. And so there are countless people, just like Julie right now, feeling like they want to contribute. Yeah, and the yeah. God, God has provided every time that we need a very specific thing to happen. He introduces someone or a relationship that says, oh, have you met so-and-so? Well, guess what? They felt led to do that. And that's how we built the team. Yeah. And we're not looking at, um, you know, we're not looking at anything outside of their heart and their passion. 
but also their competence. Like they need to be competent in, in the aspect that we're sure, you know, bringing sure. together, but it's like more their heart and their passion um, and their willingness, because right now it's a hard thing to like to do the chosen is a very difficult thing, especially when um, you know, how, how impactful it is. It help, helps people feel insecure in some aspects and they come try to attack it. Yeah, you know, especially right, it's right. like, Oh, LES is involved. Like yeah. I don't have anything to do with the show in the sense of, the content that's Dallas's job, you know. Mine's just more social media and all the stuff that God's given me, and you know, running the business and yeah, stuff. Yeah, you know, and that's like that's completely independent, you know. And and I think the content is content is pure, but God's pro providing people along the way. And the, um, what what I found is people come in and accomplish what they need to do, and some of them just go out. It was just meant for that that next step, and that's that tells me that God's in control, and what we need to do is just be. Um, quick to observe, uh, you know, really quick to see what's really happening and observing people's hearts and intentions um, and, and getting to that core of authenticity. And then uh, it, it will be just laid in front of us what we need to do because we're not the authors of this. Like we're not. Yeah. yeah, like, yeah. We will never take credit for that because it's not us. Right. God's always provided what we need at the time. And, and we've been able to take that next step. Yeah. 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 I, I know Dallas has <clears throat> spoken to this with regards to, you know, if, if a, a Bible was being delivered to a part of the world and, you know, would you evaluate the guy who drove the truck or would you evaluate the guy who bound the Bible or the guy who printed the Bible or, or would you just be thankful that the Bible made it to where yeah. it was supposed to go, you know, and there, there is in this world, um, every interface that we have with one another is an opportunity isn't it not? Is it not for for us to kind of, uh, you know, raise our understanding, learn a little bit more, glean something beyond our own little comfort zone, our little box of understanding and culture and theology, to uh, to be enriched. Bob Millet and I have said so many times. Bob said. Bob has said, I'm a better Latter-day Saint because of my friendship with Greg Johnson. I said, I'm a better evangelical because of my friendship with, with Bob Millett. We, we have cultivated something that, that quickens and sharpens and strengthens our understanding of who God is, and we've shared it with each other. And uh, we've kind of, long ago, we were sitting out in my church parking lot when I was a pastor, and I said, uh, Bob, I think it goes without saying that if on any given Tuesday, you wanted to leave the LDS faith and jump jump ship to the evangelical world, I'd be happy to receive you. And I said, I'm pretty guaranteed as well that if I were to say to you, hey, you think you could baptize me back into the LDS faith, you'd do it in a heartbeat. Fair enough? And we, we both agreed, you know. And then we said, but God has something bigger for us than that. That's right. That's right. So let's let God's agenda be the ruling agenda. We know that we would love to see each other think the way we think, but let's set that aside. And let's let God have his agenda and let's surrender our own agenda. And I think that's been the power and the significance of the relationship we've had and the opportunities we've had and what we've communicated to others is that God's agenda through the chosen, through an individual relationship, through multiply goodness, uh, through whatever we bring to the story is pretty powerful by itself. And I think the simplicity of it from my point of view is he wants our heart. Yeah. He wants us to love God. We want us to love our neighbors as ourselves yeah. and how, treat them how we yeah. want to be treated. Yeah. yeah, That's the essence of it. I, I, if I was to sum it up, that's it. That was the way he summarized it. Uh, that's right. I, guess, I, wonder where I, I wonder where I got that from, right? But, but seriously, though, like, it, it, this is one thing that, um, that I know that our, my faith background kind of has issues with in the sense of, oh, we just need to become better. Yeah. Right. Um, you know, and the shame culture, yeah. and there's a lot that's around it. And it's just like, no. We just need a deeper relationship with God Jesus. and Jesus. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that will lead to more love and more compassion for others. And if we could just do that, that that's basically turning your heart, right? And and that's what we need. And I think if the show can accomplish it, like it did for my son. Yeah, yeah. Then if, if it helps just one or two people, then that's great. But I think it can impact a lot more. And that's why we need to get it out to a billion people. Yeah. Brad, any final comments uh, on those issues from you? You know, I, I, I second what Daryl said. You know, as we receive God's grace, we're much more likely to offer it to others, including ourselves. Right, right. And we're much more likely to do the works, right? <laughs> it's not the other way around. Right. It's like I'm motivated to live in the path that Christ is leading me on because he first loved me. Yeah. Because right. he first 
sacrificed himself for me. He saved me. And so I'm, I want to give that grace to others. And putting my gifts on the altar is really just surrendering to receive so much more. So thank you for what you're doing in, in our dominant community. Not so much as when I grew up here, right? Yeah, it's changing. You know, up, it's yeah. changing yeah. and it's a beautiful It's all Greg's thing. fault. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I just, living in New York City, we came to just love people of all faiths yeah. Yeah. And, and even non-Christian faiths. We yeah. just came to love and adore and value what they brought to us. So thank you again. Wow. And well, how better can people know Jesus than to see it first in us by the way they <clears throat> love each other? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well said, Jill. I, I, you know, we are at the beginning of a brand new year, and season three is being, I think, shot uh, this year uh, sometime in March. Uh, Pre production right now. Okay. So uh, I don't know when they start dropping. I know Dallas likes to get them out as soon as he can. So we're all anticipating. Any idea when we might see episode one of season when, three? When they're ready. When they're <laughs> and not a minute sooner. Or, 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 or you say soon. <laughs> soon. There's that word again. <laughs> so uh, they're coming, hopefully sometime in 2022. And it's a great new year to start over, to begin again, to think anew. And I think I, I couldn't ask anything of our audience more than to uh, check out The Chosen. Let The Chosen touch your life and uh, maybe consider uh, engaging with a neighbor across the street or a friend at work or a family member that uh, might see things a little different and say, have you been watching The Chosen? And uh, I know that we have had conversations, pastors have been telling me, people in the churches that we know uh, have been saying that these kind of conversations are happening more and more and more. And I, I don't, I just see the hand of God in that as well. I, I can tell you... Um, um, I was telling Brad that we were invited to the governor's Christmas reception at, his, at the governor's uh, mansion, and President Allen Oaks was there, and we, 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 challenged, we chat, chatted a little bit, and I said, uh, I have no authority to thank you on behalf of evangelicals worldwide. I'm only one. But Jill and I would like to thank you and the Latter-day Saint Church, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, for allowing The Chosen to be filmed at your site down in Utah County. Uh, and I know because we've worked with you before, you, you've made that available, I think. I, I won't say that I know f for what the chosen, but I, I know that the LDS Church typically makes that available no charge, you know, uh, in our oh, we, it, we we got paid. We had, we, you, you paid. <laughs> oh yeah. We, okay. <laughs> All right. So you, you just you just uh, messed up my story. No, I, <laughs> I know when we used the tabernacle three times, the LDS Church said. Free charge, no charge. And I, I think this is a good clarity is there's a reason. And there <coughs> there's so many other benefits okay. far beyond the yeah. money that it cost us. It, it, it was like not, is insignificant. Yeah. And yeah. then there was a, a, a way that we got the money back too. Yeah. Um, you but know, but the, the generosity. The generosity was there, was there 100%. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I do believe though, is that that was the indicator because it's the liability aspect yeah. of the church yeah. to let letting a for-profit group use it. Yeah. And that's where they had to distinguish it. That's okay. why they had to move it from okay. a nonprofit into a profit. Yeah, much more complicated yeah. yep. thing than letting a group of churches use the tabernacle one yep. night. <laughs> exactly. Yep. Exactly. But it, it's been remarkable. I mean, we've seen over the last 20 to 30 years in particular, a lot of new relationships, a lot of, a lot of changing attitudes, and good things are coming from it. I think God's on the move. Uh, we, we love C.S. Lewis and the Chronicles of Narnia. Yeah. And we love to say Aslan is on the move. <laughs> He's moving and winter is coming to an end. <laughs> Springtime is coming. Yes, so is. Um, anyways, great, great, great to have you guys. Please uh, know that uh, we are praying for you and we'll be able to do that more personally and for, for your leadership and for the, the, the whole leadership team of Dallas and the writers and the musicians and the actors and what a great, uh, what a great thing's going on there. And uh, just can't, uh, can't say thank you enough for your willingness to come and be a part of building bridges with Greg Johnson. So we just want to say thanks for watching. It's Greg oh. and Jill. Oh, Come on Ooh. now. You, you, you rebranded here. Ah, you can't do this. Was, thank you. That was a slip of the tongue because I used to be. We used Wait, to I do. know the story. I yeah. watched the podcast. <laughs> so thanks for watching. Per correction. <laughs> Building Bridges with Greg and Jill. Thank you very much. Uh, you can edit that out. No. No, I need that. I have to have that. That has to go in my mind. Um, anyways, we, uh, we were so glad that you could be with us and uh, share this, like this, and subscribe. We'll see you next month with another exciting uh, topic and conversation about how to build bridges in your life and in your relationships. Have a great 2022.